It would help if I was wearing the mic. There we go. Now I'm ready for human beings to show up. Let's see how we're doing here. Oh, that was it. So everyone is here. Okay, I was afraid that I had set this to private or something during a test mode last week, but I guess we're good to go. So how is everyone? Uh, it's time for another live stream. Today's topic is going to be about clams, and I am looking forward to sharing what little bit I do know about them. I've kept clams many times over the years. Thanks for letting me know the volume's working. Uh, today's topic is, uh, I thought it'd be a good one. We haven't even talked about them at all on this channel. I mean, that's pretty amazing considering how many live streams we've done. But the one that we're doing this time, it's going to be, a, I'm going to talk about Maxima clams specifically because that is my favorite clam. And the Maxima is a beautiful tridacna clam that comes in peacock blue <laughs> or uh, yeah that's pretty much it just a very vivid blue and it's my favorite and there are other clams like Durasa, Crocea, uh, Gigas which becomes ginormous like you might have seen on Survivor when they pulled one out of the ocean to eat it um, so there's all different kinds of clams but I'm super picky and I only want Maxima clams and I have started off with clams this big you know maybe an inch inch and a half long at the most and I fed them and took care of them, and they grew into f clams that were about five, five and a half, six inches in length. And uh, that would take a few years to reach. So I thought we could talk about some of their needs and then answer your questions and see if we can um, help you address some of the things that might concern you or help you overcome the fear so you can try one out. Uh, we should start off in the first place with your livestock. Does your reef tank support a clam? Are there any kind of fish or other invertebrates that could harm your clam um, that would consider it food? Because if that's the case, then you probably wouldn't want to buy one because you'd be giving that animal a very expensive meal. And that's similar with other things like carpet anemones. You know, like you, they are known to catch fish. So are you willing to take that chance and put one in your tank? <clears throat> But a clam itself is a very friendly creature. It's not aggressive toward others. It doesn't um, encroach on other things. It, it doesn't uh, do any damage. It may move itself. Uh, you can try to put it up high, or you might want to put it down low. But wherever you put it, it may move itself to a spot it likes better. <laughs> they have a foot on the bottom that they will stretch out and latch on to something solid for security reasons. And then they can put out mesenterial fibers, I think they're called, or maybe it's a different type of fiber, that will then grab onto the rock that's nearby, sort of tethering themselves or gluing themselves to that spot. If you have a clam in your tank and it's already connected to something, you want to be very cautious to remove it carefully so you don't damage the foot, because that could actually kill the clam. And the same goes for buying one at the fish store. If it's attached to something, you don't want them to just reach in and rip it off and give it to you because odds are it may not make it. So it's much more important to work your way under it, use something, uh, I don't know, like a credit card and kind of loosen it, and then you can remove it. And the clam itself is a, it's a filter feeding animal. So it's gonna rely on the food you put in the tank. It's not something you can direct feed. There's no like clam juice you know, that will take care of its needs. But phytoplankton is a very popular choice. And nowadays we can uh, buy concentrated phytoplankton from Reef Nutrition and add that to your tank every couple of days and or even daily if you like. And it will give nourishment to the clam as it's trying to grow. Now, the smaller the clam, the more food it needs. So if you get a larger one, it can handle finding food on its own, but you get the tiny one, Oh, I'm sorry. It, it can find the food it needs on its own, but it's also taking in food from the lighting. And what it's doing is this symbiotic algae that's within the mantle of the clam. The light hits it, it grows that algae within itself, which produces sugars, which gives it energy, so that it can continue to grow. But a tiny clam has a very small mantle, and it just doesn't have enough surface area to capture everything it needs, so it really relies on some serious food 
to grow. So many, many years ago, I bought a little tiny Maxima clam, super adorable, and I put it inside my 55 gallon aquarium, but I needed to feed it. And I thought, well, how am I gonna feed this clam? So I made a clam tray, <laughs> of course, something out of acrylic, and it spanned my tank, and I had the clam sitting in it, and it was a little tray about, uh, what would that be? Three inches by three inches, maybe an inch deep. I put in a quarter of an inch of sand and I set the clam in there and it was hanging up high in the tank to where the lights were hitting it and I could actually put food into it. And what I was doing to feed the clam, I didn't squirt food into the clam. What I, I did was I elevated my gizmo to raise the clam's tray just a little bit higher than the water level of the tank so no more water could enter in and I would add some phytoplankton to the water and the water would turn green. And then after 20 minutes or so, it was clear because the clam had absorbed it all. And then I could lower it back into the tank. Uh, the one thing you have to remember if you're doing this type of feeding process where you're removing from the water and you're giving it a chance to eat, if you irritate or scare the clam, it's not gonna start eating from the moment that it happens. That's why I wanted to make this tray where it acted like an elevator. I lift it up, add the food, clam eats, lower it back down, it gets flow, it gets light, you know, nothing has changed in its life, no one touched it. But if you uh, are removing it, like in a bowl, and putting it adjacent to the tank, or on the rim of the tank, or something along those lines, there's a couple things that can happen. First of all, the clam might take a while to open up and start to feed, and secondarily, the water in the bowl or container could be cooling off, and actually make the clam cold, and then when you put it back in the tank, it's a shock back into warmth. So we, you know, that's why I chose to do my elevator system, and it worked out really well for that little guy. <clears throat> and uh, side story, just a quick digression. That little clam, you know, he was with me for several years. He grew into a large one, and one day, I don't know how this happened. Maybe someone pointed it out to me, but there was a clam for sale on eBay, and it was my clam in the in the clam elevator. <laughs> and I was, I wrote the author and or the uh, the seller. I said, "Why are you selling my clam?" And he goes, no, I have one just like it. I just used your picture. And I said, why don't you take a picture of what you're selling? Because when they see mine, they're going to think they're getting mine. And he just thought it was no big deal. And we should never do that. You know, if you're going to sell something, I always recommend you use your own picture of what the product looks like so that they know, or in this case, livestock. So there's no ugly surprises down the road when they receive said product. Um, but yeah, how annoying was that, that, you know, this guy just grabbed my picture it was very specific because you could see the acrylic box, you could see a little bit of sand, and, just, and use it as an eBay ad. Rude. All right. Um, let's talk about acclimation, and then we'll go into water parameters because these are all things that you want to know. The uh, acclimation process is pretty simple. It's like we do with a lot of creatures that we put in our tank. We float the bag for about 20 minutes or so, and then we start adding water to the bag every seven minutes until we've doubled the water volume. And at that point, usually your salinity has um, matched what the fish store had. And the temperature, of course, is right. And then you're able to remove the clam and put it in the tank. Now, you can handle a clam. It's not going to hurt it. Um, you don't want to take it out of the bag and into the air and let all the water drain out and then put it into the tank because there'll be a big air bubble inside. So what I prefer to do is basically take it out of the bag and I hold it on its side so no air can get sucked in and put it into the tank. I don't dip a clam or put it through any kind of pesticides. Clams only have a couple of pests that they can acquire. Uh, they are uh, like pyramidellid snails, which are little tiny snails that bore into their body, but you can see them with a the naked eye. And if you saw some on the shell, you would just take something like a toothpick and just flick them off and then put your clam into the tank. And if you missed some and you see it on the clam later, you can take the clam into your hands and you can remove those pests from the shell and put it right back into your reef where it belongs. The, uh, that's pretty much it for acclimation. It's not hard. I have probably bought, I'd say 10 clams over the years. And um, two of them lasted about five, six years. And uh, I had a whole, I bought a whole bunch at a, at a frag swap. I was excited. I walked past this guy's booth and he had a bunch of little tiny clams, all different colors, but all Maximas. And I said, how much for all of them? And he just looked at me and goes, really? And I was like, yeah, I'm just, throwing it out there. And so I came home with eight clams in my suitcase. <laughs> and I put them in the 400 gallon tank. And that was in my 400 gallon uh, version one. But after a few months, that tank sprung a leak and everything went to crap. And I lost those clams in the process of trying to keep anything alive. Uh, it was quite the disaster. So I lost those, unfortunately. 
Uh, you probably have seen a clam in some of my videos that was in the anemone cube, and that was years ago, but I had one in there and it also grew larger and larger. But, and remember I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, you wanna make sure you don't have animals in there that will eat clams. And in the case of that tank, I had those two dwarf moray eels, and I saw one kind of swimming around the clam and checking it out, and I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know it would eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and it did, and that was the end of the clam, and so I didn't get another one after that, and I haven't gotten one in years. And again, part of the reason is because I'm looking for a certain color. Now here's a cool little thing that you may not know, is that when you look at a clam from the side, like through the glass of your tank, it's gonna be one color. And then if you look at it from the top straight down, it'll be a completely different color. Like, blue becomes green. <laughs> um, there are maximas come in multiple colors. The gold maxima is beautiful. The blues, of course, are what I like. There are greens. Uh, there's some that are leaning into the purples. You can buy clams at your fish store. You can also get them from companies like Live Aquaria, where they'll show them on their website and you can shop. You, um, I've never even imagined going to the ocean to go find one and bring it home and stick it in my tank. Uh, but there are some of our viewers, uh, some of our YouTube audience that actually are that close to reefs, they're able to get their own. Now, what I've seen in nature has been fascinating, is some clams seemingly are, in, are bored down into the rock. And so you've got solid rock with this crevasse that is filled with a clam completely. And it just amazes me that a clam has the ability to do that, too to basically erode out what it needs so it can drop down in and be super safe. The base of the clam, the underneath, is the most um, susceptible area to predation, and so we want to protect it from any kind of harm. And one of the tricks that I used years ago was to take, I would actually, because <laughs> you know, occasionally you lose a clam, you have an empty clam shell. If you don't have an empty clam shell, you can ask the fish store, can you have an empty clam shell? And you can use the empty shell to set the new clam in, and it will attach to that smooth surface. And you can put it anywhere in your tank inside that shell. So it allows you to move it. So you can say, I like it here or I like it there. Um, and it gives you some flexibility. And sand can't get into the base of the clam. Uh, worms can't crawl into the base of the clam and start chewing on its foot. These are all things that you know, potentially could happen. Also, I might as well mention that clams die really, really fast. By the time you notice there's a problem, it's almost too late. It can happen so quickly, uh, 24, 48 hours. It can be, that clam was healthy and fine for so many years, and it just takes a turn, and uh, it's, it's very frustrating. One of the things that can be done if a clam is uh, looking distressed is, and one of the things that you can Google, is called pinched mantle disease. And it actually made the mantle, the, the soft, meaty part of the top of the clam, look all wrinkled and unhappy, you know, just kind of aggravated. And you could take the clam out of salt water and dip it into fresh water for about five, ten minutes. Like I said, Google it. And that fresh water dip could help them get over pinched or, uh, yeah, clam mantle disease and get it to release whatever was bothering it and put it back in salt water and it will, uh, it can do well. <laughs> and there were people that did this successfully. I did it myself. I had one that didn't look so hot. I did the dip, I was totally freaking out because like it's fresh water, there's no salt, no way a clam can live in this, which you know, of course it's not staying in there that long. But those few minutes were enough to knock off whatever parasites were bothering it and then it was able to reopen and it looked good for a long time. So I would like to, uh, you know, like I said, research it. Please don't just say, I heard Mark say this on the YouTube channel so I just did it. You know, find out what you have to do. I, it's important that the temperature be exactly the same. And I'm, I'm almost certain the pH has to be the same too, which is hard to do because it's saltwater, freshwater. But uh, like I said, I, if I have that wrong, that's because I haven't had to do it in forever because I haven't had a clam in forever and I haven't had to deal with any kind of pests or diseases. But I would like to, you know, I don't want you to be scared of clams. I just want you to know there's a couple things that may happen when you get one. Uh, if you decide you like it up high in the tank, like up on a rock, and it just decides to jump to the bottom of the tank, as long as it looks good and it's happy, it's fine wherever it picks. So rather than forcing it to be in a certain area, uh, maybe accept where the spot it shows. It's not unlike an anemone 
that you put in the ideal spot and then it crawls off and goes up the glass and you're thinking now what and eventually it decides to come right back to where it started or it picks a spot slightly different and uh, that is its home well same things that can happen with clams you may have one that just goes in the one spot you like and stay there forever or it could be one that decides it wants to jump off the cliff <laughs> be somewhere else but it definitely needs to get light so if it jumps off and falls down into your rock work and shade, you know, where that's not okay. It's not going to work its way out and find light again. You need to get it back out into the lighting so it gets some good intense lighting. Um, clams will close up somewhat at night. They won't close shut. Uh, one of the indications of a healthy clam at the fish store when you're shopping is to move your hand over the top of the clam and if it quickly tries to close, it's being responsive, that's good. If the clam just stays like this the whole time and has no reaction whatsoever, I'd probably skip buying that one because there's something not right there. Clams, uh, they, the reason they close is they sense the shadow and they do it for protection. So by moving your hand over the top, you know, between the light and the clam, they're like, oh, what's happening? And when you put the new clam in your tank, fish are gonna swim over it and you're gonna see it closing a lot the first few days as it gets used to its tank mates because you know, you got a fish like Spock that's like a small whale swimming over it, and the thing's going to and then it'll open up again. But after a few days, it should they all should be open. Well, I say they all. I'm already thinking about the eight that I bought, and I'm like, you're going to get eight, right? <laughs> Don't get eight. Just get one. Uh, try it out. See how it does. And if you like it and it's going well, get one more. Uh, maybe you can find some that complement each other's colors. It, they're beautiful in groups. Um, another company that makes clams, uh, when I say makes, I mean, they actually aquaculture them from sperm and eggs and they grow them from specks of crumbs into little clams that eventually come to the right size to sell is ORA which was one of the videos I did a few years ago which is oceans reefs and aquariums in Florida and ORA sells all their livestock to fish stores and you can tell your fish store I want a clam from ORA and they'll bring it in so that is an option too besides live aquaria that I was suggesting before now Let's talk about water parameters really quick because that's an important one too. And clams are just like corals and they pretty much need reef parameters. So we're looking at 1.026 salinity or 35 PPT. We're looking at nitrate that's somewhere under 10. Phosphates have to be up slightly, like 0 0.03, 0 0.07, somewhere in there. Um, calcium should be around 375 to 450. So if you like 425, that's great. Uh, magnesium is going to need to be somewhere around 1380, 1400. And uh, alkalinity needs to be somewhere between 8 and 11, like usual. So, you know, maybe 9. I, I don't know that I could say clams do well in those lower alkalinity tanks that run at 7. That might be one tank that should not have a clam. But if you have one and you're doing that, please let us know in, the, in this conversation or in the comments after the video is released. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I'd even like to see pictures of your clams. So if you have a chance and you already have one, come over to Club Milo's Reef and post some pictures. We have a really great group on Facebook. It's got, uh, I don't know, 5,700 people in there. And we have one rule, and that is to treat others kindly so we don't make fun of each other or put each other down. And we also, uh, it's not a selling group, it's just a group to share your tank and ask questions. So if you have clams, I'd love to see them. And I'd love you to take a picture from the front and then take one from above and let us see the difference with two pictures side by side. That would be really cool. And what I'll do is later on, I'll go look up some um, clam pictures that I have that I took in the past and I'll post them in the group so you guys can see what I've kept in the past. I guess they'll all look the same because of the color I like. <laughs> but maybe I can find some of the little ones I found too. Maybe I'll do some digging and see what I can come up with. Um, I'm just going to leave that on the screen for a minute. Well, actually, I'd like it to be on top of all this white. <laughs> ah, the tank looks so much better already, right? So we'll do that just for now. Um, all right, what else? You may be wondering why I haven't wanted any other the clams, you know, the Crocias, the uh, Durasas. I don't find them to be pretty enough. I'm, I'm super picky about that. I, there's a certain look that I really like. I like the shell of the, of the Maxima. <clears throat> it has these scoots that come out that are very pronounced. So they have a smooth shell. And so 
Um, that's why I prefer it. I had a friend who... <clears throat> oh, so I mentioned the reef parameters. This is also an animal that's going to need regular dosing. So if you're maintaining your water quality by use of sim simply doing water changes, that clam probably won't do well in your care. It's going to need something added. And even when I had mine way back in my 29 gallon a long time ago, I was dosing B ionic every single day. And that way it gave the clam alkalinity and calcium on a regular basis, kept that number very stable, and the clam used that to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was a very beautiful clam. I had it for a long time. They can move about, um, besides the foot dragging itself to a new spot, through jet propulsion. They can just shut really quick and that will blow them over. Um, if something tries to go into it, the uh, clam can slam shut, but it can tolerate some strange things like a fish swimming and rubbing against it. I mean, the eel didn't get attacked. It swam right over the mantle. It was almost lying on top of it. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. But then I guess it decided it tasted good. <laughs> and I missed that. I just found an empty shell. I was like, wow, okay, thanks. But uh, I'll tell you this. Clams are not toys. They are animals. And uh, there was a story I read many years ago on a forum where a guy, I don't know if he was high or what, but he decided he wanted to know what it felt like. <laughs> so he reached into his tank and he's trying to touch the mantle of the clam. <clears throat> and of course the clam did not like this and slammed shut on his finger. Well, when it slammed shut, he freaked out and he ripped his arm out of the water and he threw water all over the metal halide bulbs and he burned his arm on the metal halide bulb and then he fell off his stepladder. Oh, I just died laughing reading the story and I told him, thank you so much for posting this. <laughs> because we needed the laughter. But uh, yeah, don't, don't pet your clam. <laughs> <laughs> Just let it be and enjoy it for what it is. Um, I, I pretty much think that's all I've got. I, I didn't have a lot. I don't have tons of experience, but there's a great book called Clams by James Fothery. I'll be sure to put a link in this video's description to where you guys can get that. I'm sure it's on Amazon. Um, if you're going to any of the trade shows, odds are that book is for sale in Dirk's booth. Dirk always has a bunch of stuff, including books. And you can get the clam book. It's, uh, as a matter of fact, I gave two of those books away at MACNA to the group that came to our uh, Club Milo's Reef meetup that we had on Saturday morning. And that was pretty cool. They were autographed copies, so that was fun. All right. Um, I guess I see a word pop up here about uh, quarantine. Could you put a clam in a quarantine tank? You can temporarily. Um, and that would mainly be for observation. And yes, it absolutely can be done. If the water temperature is stable and the water parameters are reef-like, it could work. You could even feed that tank and uh, with phytoplankton and let that clam absorb food. Um, but the bigger the tank, obviously, the more phytoplankton you have to add because as you add it to the water, it's going everywhere. It's not staying congealed and you can't just like squirt it at a clam and expect it to grab all of it in the first puff. You know, it's going to just take some time. One of the best ways to feed phytoplankton to your tank is to turn off the protein skimmer for about 45 minutes. And while that is off, the phyto stays in the system and everything is, you know, that's a filter feeder could take a bite and have some of that phyto. But uh, I've never, like, taken a clam and said I'm going to put it through 45 days of quarantine or something like that. Uh, if it was in my quarantine tank, it was just a few days. I looked at them. They still were healthy. They were open. They were happy happy as a clam, and I moved them into my reef where they belong because they'll be happiest there because that's the ideal environment where a quarantine tank is always kind of a, uh, it's kind of a crapshoot. You know, you, it's set up, it should work, but uh, it's not your reef. <laughs> your reef's where all the best stuff is, the best food, all the attention it gets. <clears throat> and uh, someone, I noticed a question popped up here also talking about could it be with a trigger? You need to Google that. You need to see if triggers eat clams and uh, find out if that's a problem. I've actually never kept a trigger, so I can't answer that question. So that, I believe, is everything I can think of when it comes to cl <laughs> clam care. And so, I, I don't know, I, I made it almost half an hour. Not too bad. Let's see what we got here. I'm going to see if there's any specific questions. <laughs> uh, one person said, I spent a lot of clams on a new car. So did I. Let's see. Uh, okay, here's a good one. How small of a tank will work for a clam? Uh, I found that uh, my 29 was perfectly suited for one. 
and it was, I had my rock work kind of wrapped around and it was right in the front of, of my 29 gallon. Let's see if I can pull that up really quick. Show you a picture. One second here, I gotta go to my past tanks. And it's probably on page three. All righty, that'll work. So I'll switch this to this. Oh, and I guess I need to move this over so you can see the picture. And there's my clam right there at the bottom. It's right here. And that was grown, that was actually pretty young age. Matter of fact, this right here next to the clam, these little weird looking things, was my bubble tip anemone that had split at, that night before. And there's one piece here, a piece here, and a piece down here. It actually ended up tearing itself into four pieces in that tank. And then eventually all of those are in my anemone cube to this day. So that's pretty cool. Um, this was my original 29 gallon. You guys like flashbacks. I know it's not flashback thir or throwback Thursday, but uh, let me see if I can scoot this over. I'm sorry, I can't see what you guys are seeing. Give me a second to rearrange this window so it'll play nice. Uh, let's see if I can do it this way. No. Normally I can see what's happening. <laughs> uh, it really doesn't want to let me put this on. The Why is it doing that? Hang on a second. Let me see what's happening here. Current application. I want this to be it. And we'll go in a little bit bigger here. Uh, so this tank was running for seven years. I had my share of live rock and, uh, and uh, hair algae. I used power compact lights over it. There's the anemone. And some of the fish. So anyway, this is on my website. It's the 29 gallon. All right, we'll come back to that. That wasn't that wasn't the best presentation ever. Um, but uh, I'll find some good clam pictures and post those up for you guys later. Uh, but smaller, you know, I did a Pico tank one time with a beautiful little uh, seahorse, and that was three gallons of water. That was even harder. <laughs> and I had a I had one or two clams in that tank, and they were really pretty and really tiny, and I could feed that tank very easily. I could feed that tank a lot because it was easy to do a water change. The biggest challenge of that tiny tank was temperature and salinity. So I had to stay on top of uh, water top off to make sure that it wouldn't change in salinity. All right. Hope that helped, Abel. Let's see. <laughs> Alfredo says, this is a great topic. I recently picked up the ugliest ones I could find in hopes they will survive. There are also clams that, uh, or um, mussels, that are in our tanks that come in as hitchhikers on the side of corals. And I would never remove those and toss them out. And in my tank, I've got this big lobo right here. And on the side is a mussel type clam. I, I don't know the exact name of what it is because I, you know, I didn't buy it for it. But I've had this clam for probably six, seven years. And it opens up about that far and it's grabbing food every single day. And then I believe there's one somewhere in this end of my tank as well. Another one of those filter feeding clams. Um, some kind of a sand clam. So uh, some people have in the past, one, instead of doing a refugium, they thought, well, why don't I just use a bunch of mussels and create an entire zone and let that be my natural filtration. They will literally filter the water so I don't need a protein skimmer. I don't need this. I don't need that. And there's been really cool demonstration videos by you know people at NOAA where they will show a tank filled with mussels and they add a whole bunch of brown water and then 30 minutes later it's crystal clear because the clams filtered it all out. Yeah, you can do that. It's a, it's an interesting experience. I don't know if I if you'll want to do that long term or if it was like, oh, that was kind of cool, but kind of want to do something new now. But uh, very few people have actually gone through and got a bunch of filter feeding clams to load up a refugium zone basically and let that be their filtration. You know, I can't, I can't imagine 10 people doing it. It's just uh, one of those things. Let's see. Patrick, welcome to the, uh, to the stream. First time. 
So I'm glad you're here. Let's see. Cindy said, I had two Maxima clams in the past and they died after a couple of months or a few months. Uh, so the question is going to be what caused their death? Was it just a lack of the elements that they needed? Was there a fish in your tank that was picking at them? Um, did something fall on them? Did they not get enough light? Uh, those are some of the things that come into play. Or Odds are, didn't get enough food. Because a lot of people, and maybe you included, uh, have very low nitrate and low phosphate. It, because you're setting up tanks with dry sand and dry rock. And I keep telling people, use live rock. <laughs> and this is one of the reasons, because of the good stuff that's in there. Ah, there's a good one. So Macy's daddy says, I love copper bands, but they also eat clams. And I do have a copper band. So that's logical. Butterflies will definitely pick at clams. So any kind of butterfly that's in your system, that you're going to take a chance. Another fish that could nip at a clam would be in the dwarf angelfish family. Specifically a flame angel could be a problematic uh, situation for a clam. Now in that 29 gallon you saw, I had a clam and I had a flame angel. Um, I also had a long nose hawkfish in there and I had an arrow crab and everyone got along just fine and eventually I broke down that tank and I set up the 280 and I moved the clam from that little tank into a 280 gallon reef where it had metal halide lighting instead of power compacts which power compacts were basically a precursor to T5s. They were probably half the strength of what a T5 could put out but it worked okay for me at the time. Um, Andy says, how much have you seen in your dosing requirements will rise with the addition of a clam? Well, with a small one, it'll be very little because it's not using much. But I had a friend, his name was Rick, and he had a Durasa that was, no joke, the size of a basketball. And he was pumping in all the alkalinity he could in that tank on a daily basis, trying to keep up with this enormous clam that just soaked it up constantly. So you would obviously be testing your water weekly, and you could say, hey, my alkalinity, my calcium, they're both coming down. I need to up my dosing a little bit to compensate or to uh, correlate with the usage of my tank and maintain the right standard. So this is why it's so important for us to test. And... I would not say use a clam as a way to visually see if your tank is okay. I would say, oh yeah, the clam's open, so I got plenty of alkalinity. <laughs> Don't do that. Please test your water. That's why I always talk about water test Saturday. D3V1115 says, can I have a clam in a 10-gallon tank? Yes, you can have a clam in a 10-gallon tank. The question is, how long can you keep it alive in there? Let's see. Yes, the Bissell organ, the, those strings I was talking about, if they're torn, they could actually be torn from the base of the clam. It's not like they tore off rock, but it just it's sort of like your hair being ripped out of your skull and there's like a bare patch of flesh that's ruined. Imagine that on the bottom side of the clam because it was manhandled or it was ripped off the rock. I do remember um, when fish stores were selling clams, you know, a long time ago, 15 years ago, the, the employee would reach in and just pull it off the rock and you just watched it pull it and you're like wait stop don't do that you know can you can we gently coax it off the rock and they're like what and you were just thinking well it's gonna die um i'm gonna tell you another story um i'm not gonna mention any names because i don't want to embarrass anybody but i had someone come over and he loved clams and he had lots of them uh, to say he had 15 to 25 would not be a, an overstatement. He had a lot of clams, and he loved buying them. And he just couldn't get enough of them. And so he kept buying more and more. Uh, so at that time when he was doing this, there was a real problem with one country they were being imported from. And I'm, I, whenever I try to think of the story, I always forget the name of the country. But let's just say it was Taiwan just because I need some imaginary country, okay? Um, so all the clams came from Taiwan, seemed to have a clam disease of some kind. And he bought more clams that came from Taiwan, quote-unquote, and put them in his tank, and it killed his other clams, and it died, of course, too. And so he lost all these clams. And he just, you know, he made enough money, he's like, I'm just going to buy more clams. And so he came over, and he was telling me how, you know, he had just bought this clam, and it was another one of those diseased ones, and seven were dead, and, uh, you know, he was just going to get some more. And I was kind of shocked because 
he already had healthy clams and he bought a new one that ended up polluting his tank, you know, in some form or fashion. And it killed a lot of his. And he's just like, I'm going to buy more. Well, I mean, how do you know, not know you're going to get more of the diseased clams from the same area? You know, are you going to say, well, I want from Indo-Pacific? Are you going to do anything different? Anyway, I just, I was kind of shocked. My mouth kind of hung open. And I said, well, if those were puppies, some of you would be here arresting you. And I, then I closed my mouth like, wow, did I just say that out loud? <laughs> and uh, he was here with his partner. And his partner was say, actually came up and whispered to me and said, thank you so much for saying that. And apparently it, it clicked in his mind. And he's like, yeah, they really aren't disposable animals. These are living creatures and every one of them matters. And so he, uh, he actually at one point told me, I'm not going to be buying them like I used to. I do want to get a few more, but uh, you made a good point. So that was, you know, a learning experience. And like I said, I'm not going to, you know, say his name or anything like that. But super nice guy. I just, you know, just wasn't quite seeing it the way I saw it. So by visiting each other and talking to each other, it kind of helps us keep our morality up, I guess you could say. Um, I don't know. I just, it, it was an important thing to me. I was just kind of shocked. And at that time, way back then, we were worried, are we taking too many things from the ocean? Are we hurting it? Now, these clams are being farm-raised. They're being raised in lagoons for hobbyists. They're not being taken from the ocean like, ooh, there's a clam, take it. It's not that. There's farms with thousands, and they will then bring them in, and they get sent to wholesalers and out to all the fish stores across the nation. And you can buy aquacultured clams that are already used to the kind of foods we have. And they're not relying on something that's in the ocean. So it gives you an even better chance for success. So um, don't fear getting any. Be sure you are trying to get aquacultured. You know, always ask the store where did it come from and see if you can get an answer. Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. Um, or you can ask for a specific one, and that way they have to bring in what you're asking for. All right. Oh, this is a good tip. I like it. Andy said uh, he had a fish that was bothering a clam, so he took a, chair, a strawberry basket, those plastic baskets, and stuck it over the top of the clam where all the light got in and the flow got in, but the fish couldn't mess with it. And he kept it that way for about two weeks, and then after that he could remove it, <clears throat> and the clam was left alone. So, and keep in mind too, when you put in something brand new in your tank, no matter what it is, a coral or a clam, uh, or a frag, you know, I know a frag is a piece of a coral, but I'm just saying like a colony or a frag or whatever you put, your fish may be interested and they might even peck off some algae and stuff they find. And they could be eating algae off the side of the clam, for example, if there's any on there, or some worm or something that they find appealing. That doesn't mean they're going to hurt your clam necessarily. So, but if you see them constantly messing with it, uh, Andy Solutions actually a really good one to put a protective dome over it. And those baskets are a, a great solution. All right. Hi, Scott. <clears throat> Do blood shrimps eat clams? No, they don't. Let's see. I'm scrolling here, guys. I guess while I'm scrolling looking for questions, I'll, I'll talk about the gigas clam. The gigas clam is the biggest clam of them all. It is one that grows to be 24, 36 inches across, just monster clams. They are typically sold <clears throat> to uh, public aquariums where they have a 1500 gallon system or larger to put them on display. I saw a couple of very old ones in Waikiki Public Aquarium. That was beautiful. Uh, the Dallas World Aquarium here in my local area has two or three in a huge tank. And uh, I've seen some when I was at the Steinhardt. So any public aquarium you go to, usually you'll find a gigas clam. G-I-G-S. Gigas. And I'm sorry, G-I-G-A-S. And those clams, they're not inexpensive. <laughs> I remember <clears throat> a gigas clam came up for sale on eBay, and I think it was $1,000. And that was, you know, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, about 12 years ago. And maybe it was even slightly higher. And all of us were talking about on our club forum, like, oh, who's going to buy this clam? It's amazing. Someone needs to buy it. And one of the local fish stores saw the ad and decided on the spot to build a 1,000-gallon aquarium 
to put that clam in and he made it his showpiece in his store and he put up a huge tank that was eight feet by eight feet by probably two feet and that was his thousand gallons and then he put the gigas in there and he put in really shallow flat rock work and he put in just a shoaling amount of fish you know like tangs were all swimming through it and it was amazing and we'd go visit the famous clam that came from ebay because <laughs> that was a big deal back then now it's like oh i got it on amazon whatever but uh, back then, getting something like a clam on eBay was kind of unheard of. Let's see. Uh, thank you, David, for bringing that up. I didn't think of that one. Um, the polyclad flatworms, the really large ones, they're on my Critter ID page under the pests or under worms. Uh, those things are actually designed to kill a clam. They they're a flat worm that crawls over the top and looks like clam meat as it's eating the clam underneath and then there's an empty shell. <clears throat> so if you see these very large flatworms in your tank, you need to siphon them out um, before they get to your clam so they don't harm it. Also, uh, predatory snails like whelks will eat a clam. And that has happened to me once before as well. Oh, Pacific East Aquaculture, another one that, aqua, that grows clams. You definitely want to uh, shop from them. That's another one. That's Dr. Mac's business. And uh, when I was at uh, a recent show... <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's really dry. When I was at a recent show, they had some very large, like, 6 to 8-inch clams for sale. And I, that was when I was in Iowa. And it was kind of a neat thing to see because, you know, you're seeing everyone showing up with frags. And this vendor came with these huge clams. And I was like, ah, oh, that's so cool. And I kind of wanted one. But at the same time, again, it was one of those things where I'm there on Saturday and I'm flying home Sunday afternoon. And I didn't want something in a bag in my hotel room where the temperature is usually cool for such a long time for I'm in a plane. The one when I bought the eight clams, I mean, I bought them. He bagged them. I put them in my suitcase and went straight home within two hours and I was already acclimating them, you know, within another three or four hours. So, you know, they were in a bag, maybe a mat of matter of uh, six hours before they got in my tank. I was able to keep them ha happy. Um, Green Navy says, I have a clam with a big hole. Um, is that normal? I've had it almost two years. Do you mean, because there's a, there's like a thin, narrow part, and then there's a larger, which kind of makes you think of a mouth, because one sucks in water and one blows it out. Sometimes the hole will look actually quite large. Uh, it doesn't mean that the clam is suffering. If the clam is just way hanging open, it's just so open, it's never been that open before, and it's staying that way, or can't even retract shut, like the shell is so heavy it can't close itself anymore, that would be an indication the clam is in distress. Uh, there are crazy stories where people have fixed a clam, like the hinge broke on the shell, and they would use putty and create some kind of a, a method to where the clam could continue to exist a little bit longer, sort of like putting a cast on your leg. And I thought that was kind of clever. That was a, one of those one in a million stories you, you almost never come across. Let's see. Um, I think this question is to me. <clears throat> Do you have an auto feeder? How long did the copper band play nice with its meal? Oh, you must be talking to somebody else. Um, I have a copper band in mine. I do have an auto feeder. And so I'll just answer this question, even if it's not meant for me. Um, and the uh, copper band likes mysis or mycids. So fortunately for me, I, I can put that in every single night, frozen food, and it just goes and devours it all. But it doesn't seem to care about the flake food. <clears throat> Bonnie asks, can you dip a clam in coral dip for pest control? Um, I would not. I think that it's a little too harsh. But definitely double check. Um, see what you can find on Google. Maybe something gentle like Revive would work. Um, I would keep an eye on the animal as it's in the dip to make sure it's not acting weird. Um, but they're just, it's, they're just not loaded with things. You know, I wouldn't get a clam and say, oh my god, my tank has ick. That's not what's going to happen. If there's anything on the clam, it's typically on the outside on the shell that you could actually brush off with a toothbrush. So it's just a visual thing. 
Also, one time I had a really pretty Maxima in my tank, and if you've seen my pest presentation, or uh, yeah, my uh, pest presentation that I do when I travel, I show how the zoanthids completely grew up the side, and I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. I wonder how far this will go. And they grew all the way to the top, and they closed the clam. And I was like, oh, wow, I do have to actually intercede. I didn't think that was going to happen. And so I had to reach down in the tank, and I was starting to pull the zoanthids, and they came off like a mat. They just came right off. It's like the shell had an oil on it, and they couldn't stick to it. So they could grow on it, but they weren't latched in, you know, like how things grow onto rock, and it's almost impossible to remove. And I peeled it off, and then the clam just went, ah, and just opened up again. <laughs> it was pretty great. Reef and Dive says, I really want a clam, but my biggest problem is I have a Valentini puffer that has a reputation for eating clams. <sighs> well, have you been feeding it clams? Because that would be part of the problem. The other choice is to get one small, inexpensive one and see how it goes. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, what's a, that's why I started this whole presentation with what livestock do you already have before you get something new? Because you could be putting in an expensive meal for that fish that you already have or eel or, or whatever it is that goes through. Yeah, now I see who that question was for. It was not for me. Um, Michael Wells says, what do you prefer, Clarity or using filter floss? Uh, the Clarity is great, and mine is running smoothly. It's happening right here down there. You can see it right there. And uh, it's helping keep the water clear. It's kind of great. Uh, I think, uh, I know that the fleece material, or uh, not fleece, uh, the batting, you can buy huge rolls of it for very little money, and it's just a matter of you reaching in and taking out a section and putting in a fresh one um, every so many days or once a week. And that's obviously going to be more economical, but it doesn't take care of itself. Where this one, I can hook it up and it can run for about two months without me touching it. And so that's super convenient and I just have to swap out the roll. Uh, Gia Carlo says, have you ever considered switching your videos to audio format for us to listen to via Spotify or Apple iTunes or whatever. Yeah, that's definitely come up a few times. I just haven't done it yet. Yeah, that's kind of, Mojave. I really don't think clams are ideal for a quarantine system. I don't, I, I just don't like the idea because I just feel like they're going to end up. <sighs> okay, let's say you have a great quarantine system. Let's say it's got good filtration and it's established and you put the clam in there. The clam needs to eat. Well, you've got a great filter. You've taken away what the clam needs. And a lot of times quarantine systems don't have a great light on them. So is there enough light to give that clam what it needs? But if you have everything it needs and you're dosing that tank to maintain everything, it is doable to have that clam in there for a duration and keep an eye on it. Make sure there's nothing weird that shows up before you add it to your own tank so you don't put the rest of your livestock at risk. It's not a bad idea. But everything has to be set up right if you want to be able to do it. Luke says, I'm setting up a 100-gallon mixed reef tank. Would a purple tang and a white-tailed bristletooth tang be a good algae team? Other, any other fish you would really like and enjoy, and enjoy watching? I actually have the purple tang and the bristletooth tang right there. And they um, have been eating their foods. They have been getting along with each other without too much trouble. Oh, there's the cleaner wrasse. It's still alive. And... Uh, the purple tang's more aggressive and is more, it's not really looking for algae. You know, it's, it's eating nori. <laughs> it's like free algae, but not like hair algae. But the bristletooth tang is a worker tang. It's great. I feel like any tank that has space could have a bristletooth tang or a yellow eye cold tang because they clean the glass, they, they nip at the sand, and they nip at the rock. They're constantly sucking up whatever they can find to get algae out of your tank. Uh, Ellery asks, what's the longest 
I'm assuming time, you ever got to keep a clam alive. And I would say minimum, I mean, a, a maximum of probably five years. So I believe it was you that said that they didn't make it past a couple of months. Something must not have been right. And, you know, maybe now your tank is better suited for a clam than it was back then. So it might be worth trying one more time. I like how you guys are keeping this clean. I see people joking around, but thank you. Because I know this topic can be funny. And Ellery, I don't know the answer to your question about, I do know you can do a freshwater dip, but uh, it's gotta be right and uh, you'll want to know exactly how to do it. So maybe the information you found on the forums would be exactly what the recipe for success. Let's see. Emmanuel, I uh, can't quickly show you that. I mean, it's, it's kind of up behind everything right now, but I have an entire video that shows exactly how it looks and you can just watch that. It's the reverse check valve video. So just type in reversed check valve Milev in, in the YouTube search and it'll come up instantly. And it shows exactly how it was installed and how it works and it shows it happening over and over. It's a really short video. It's not like one of these big long live streams. Uh, the Lone Aquarius says, you've talked about mentioning moving the claim here and there. Are you having any concerns of lifting it out of the water? Um, why do people, why do users burp a clam? Um, they're trying to get the air out of the clam. And that's one of the reasons why I prefer not to get it out into the air for as much as possible. And one of the reasons I prefer to have the clam on its side versus standing straight up where it can drain out through the, the uh, area where the foot is. And so I don't have that issue. Oh, another thing to keep in mind, when you're working in your tank, you could get squirted by a clam. So especially like you're doing a water change and now the clam has been exposed to some air or maybe all air because you've drained out that much water, the clam may do this and squirt you in the face with water because it senses your shadow. So uh, make sure that you're wearing eye protection when you're in your tank. Keep your mouth shut. I always tell you guys that because you don't want to ingest any of the water from your aquarium. And uh, it is possible while you're acclimating a clam, while you're inspecting it, for it to squirt you. So again, that's another time to keep that in mind. It could happen. Or it might squirt something that matters nearby that can't get wet. So it could be lighting, could be uh, an older cell phone that can't handle moisture like the new ones can. You know, it's something to keep in mind. But uh, I'm not actively pulling clams out of water nonstop. I'm more like it went into, you know... A, uh, a cooler, I did my acclimation process, I've inspected it, I maybe brushed it off with a toothbrush, and then I went ahead and I put it into my tank. It was out of water for mere seconds. Didn't even have a chance to drain any liquid out. I have a feeling in the past I did put mine in Revive, um, but uh, that was so long ago I just don't recall. Sorry guys. And then Daryl Marshall says, what's a good claim to start with? <laughs> a healthy, happy one would be my best answer. There's so many kinds out there. You have to find the kind you like, the look you like, and then find someone that's reputable that sells them and, uh, and maybe even check to see if they have a guarantee. Is there some kind of a, like Live Aquaria has a 14-day guarantee. So it's nice to know if things don't go well that they will replace it. But uh, you want to make sure your tank is nice and established and mature. It's not a new tank where you're just trying to decorate it with a lot of new stuff. And then Tim says, when you say stable, how stable is stable? If your calcium goes from 360 one week to 410 the next, is that too much of a swing? And uh, the same with alkaline magnesium. Well, if you're dosing properly, those numbers should stay very stable from week to week. 360 to 410 is not much. 360 to 550, that's a lot. Um, alkalinity, that's seven that goes to 14 and back to eight and then back to 12 and then back to seven and a half, you know, that bouncing around like, you know, like a horrible stock market, that would not do well for a lot of livestock, let alone the clam. So 
you want to try and keep your numbers as tight as you possibly can. There's always room for variance, and it's one of the reasons why it's so important to test every single week. So if you test every Saturday, you can then decide based on the result, the test results, if you need to adjust your dosers to add more of something or to dose less of something to make sure you keep it right in that target range that you've chosen. Uh, Eric says, "Is there are all clams equal in terms of hardiness? That's a good question. Um, all the ones that we get, you know, that you could buy online, I would say they're going to be hardy. The, probably the one that if you happen to see it, which it's not like you couldn't, would be the gigas. You know, one that becomes a ginormous clam that belongs in a public aquarium. It's possible you'll find it for sale somewhere. Or some company, like maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe Pacific East Aquaculture, maybe Ore sells little tiny gigas clams that you can grow into something bigger. But eventually it's going to grow big. And uh, that could be, I, I would assume that's a really challenging species just based on what I've heard from public aquarium uh, specialists that have to take care of them long term. So I find that Maximas are not hard. Uh, I think Dur Durassa and Crocea are also simple enough clams. And all of these clams are Tridacna. So it's Tridacna Maxima or T Maxima, T Crocea, T Durassa. And uh, getting some education about clams, reading some articles, getting a book on clams would be a really good first step. I would just basically really recommend you guys do that. Uh, before you go off and buy a clam. I know this video is going to tell you a lot of things, but there's going to be all, so much more that you can benefit from reading a book. Ah, good question. I didn't even mention this. Uh, what would be the flow requirement of a clam? It needs to be a gentle flow to where the clam feels safe and doesn't feel like it's getting blown over. Um, the mantle itself should be able to be open. It's possible for it to like flap a little bit in the flow, but it shouldn't be like curled over because it's really getting hit by a uh, gyre, for example, or the or Vortec at 100%. You know, and also a clam can kind of be behind a rock. You know, so you've got your big tank, like uh, I have a big tank, and see like right here, I've got all this rock right here, and there's my Vortec. I could have it right in that little niche right there. That'd probably be a perfect spot for a clam, and it would be at an angle where I could see it this way and it'd be really nice and enjoyable. So uh, you can kind of shelter it a little bit from getting hit with too much flow. Another spot in this tank, if you wanted to go up high, could be up inside the Acropora, like down in, in between these two layers. It could go in that spot, and it might stay there. It might not. It might not like it there. And uh, then way over here on this side, it could go right behind this maize coral. And clams don't put out any sweepers or things that could hurt uh, the neighboring corals. Now the corals could hurt the clam, so you don't want to put near an aggressive species like like Hydnophora or like a torch coral. It's possible that it could actually sting the mantle of the clam and make the clam close up or even start to get sick. So kind of look at your placement, check on your livestock late at night, check on it early in the morning, check on it in the middle of the night, look at it during the middle of the day and see what's reaching where to see if maybe that clam could go to a better spot, which is one of the reasons why I was saying before, if you put the clam inside an empty clam shell, so it has that little like, it's sort of like a teacup in a saucer, right? You can move it slightly, and then you could even putty the shell where you need it to be, and the clam will be holding onto that empty shell. And so now you've got it in a nice, safe, secure cradle, and the clam is holding on and feels safe, and nothing can bore into it from below. So you could do that. And then Odile, Odile says, how long should your tank be set up before you get a clam? I always like to say nine months. Um, I always go with nine because I feel like in nine months, you have seen all the craziness happen in your tank. You've run into the issues that happen to new hobbyists or even new tanks. And uh, you've overcome some hurdles and now things are stabilizing. So I like the nine month mark only because I feel at that point you've become mature with that tank itself. It isn't that... You know, for example, if you have five years experience having aquariums, nine months of reef keeping is still a big learning curve. And now that you're really comfortable with your tank and you've been able to really dial in all your dosings to get the numbers where they stay consistent week after week after week allows you to put in something that might be slightly more challenging, such as a clam. 
How do you know when a clam is dying or dead and when do you need to remove it? Well, <laughs> when they die, they die so fast that typically when you're removing it, you're removing an empty shell. I mean, that's just, that's the thing. They can die in 24 to 48 hours. Um, and so if you catch a clam that's gaping, which means the mouth is, the, the opening that the water flows out is so big, or you see the mantle is curled inside the shell and the shell is just wide open, and there's, you're seeing much more shell than usual because there's less mantle because it's, it's receding. That's a really bad sign and there's, it, it, it could be too late already. It's possible to put through a freshwater dip and maybe it'll recover. Uh, it could be that it's receding because it's starving to death because there's not enough nutrients in the tank. Things that you could feed the, uh, the clam besides um, phytoplankton and rotifers would be products like Polyp Labs Reefroids, uh, Benepet's Bene Reef that I use. Um, all the, uh, there's a, a food design for Goniopora that would probably do great for clams as well. It's a very small planktonic sized food. And these foods are so fine that your fish smell it, they want to eat it, but there's nothing to eat. It's dust, but the clam will be able to capture it. Now, the reason I like Benepet's is because you can use a lot of it and you don't end up with nutrient problems. You don't end up with cyano. You don't deal with nitrates rising or phosphates going up. It's really good, clean food. So that's the one I recommend. But uh, phytoplankton is a very important part of their diet too. And you're gonna have to make that part of your regime of buying uh, phyto or growing your own. There's an article on my website that teaches you how to grow phytoplankton if you wanna do that. And I thought about growing it again just so we could do a video about it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, haven't had the time to do it. Uh, Weevil asked the question, can a clam mate in your tank? Yes, clams can spawn. They, uh, you're going to need a male clam, you're going to need a female clam, just like you're thinking. And each one would spawn into the water, the fertilization of the eggs would occur, and if some happened to settle out and nothing in your tank ate it, which would be impossible, you could potentially see little tiny clams one day, but don't, don't expect it. Rather, you're just gonna see some spawning event. It's really neat. You take some cool pictures, you take a cool video, you share it on Facebook, you, you send it to a buddy in a text, look at this craziness, and that's the end of it. Your skimmer took care of it and, it's, and no more. So don't, uh, don't expect to have baby clams come from having some clams in your tank. That's not how this works. Uh, the people at ORA that are growing them, the ones at Pacific East Aquaculture, they're growing them. My hat, I mean, my hat is off to those people. That's amazing that they're able to do that. And when they post the pictures, and I've shared some of those pictures over on the Mila's Reef page. Let me stick this on the screen for you. Um, I always recommend you guys follow this page. This is my Facebook business page. And I share all kinds of cool things that come across. And I remember sharing pictures from ORA where they showed the tiny little clams next to a ruler so you could actually see it was like a sixteenth of an inch. And to think that was going to become a one inch clam one day that you and I could buy and put in our tank is really amazing to me. All right. Brad says, I have a standard 120 gallon with an MP40 on each side. Do I think that's enough? Yes, I do. The Facebook group uh, was called Club Milos Reef. You can do a search for it, or uh, you can just go to facebook.com slash group slash Milo's Reef. All my pages are always Milo's Reef. So YouTube is Milo's Reef, Instagram is Milo's Reef, uh, Milo's Reef's on Facebook as well. Um, there's even a Twitter, but I don't use it very much. All right. Uh, oh, you know what? <clears throat> EJ said, I saw on another channel where clowns were hosting or living inside a clam. And if you go to this YouTube channel, to the community tab, I posted a picture of a huge clam with little tiny cl uh, clownfish inside it that my buddy took pictures of a week ago. He was at a fish store. He goes, look at this craziness. And he sent me like nine pictures and I took one and shared it with you guys. That can happen. You can have different animals living in or uh, literally in the clam or very close to the top of it and just kind of hang around it. It does happen. It, it is really weird, but 
somehow the clam doesn't get mad. Abel, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, here's a good question. Um, Plain Ice 77 says, what's the minimum size clam you prefer to get? If you get a tiny one, it's more challenging. So if you can get one that's three inches in size, it will be a little more hardy. It can do better absorbing some of its food from the lighting of your tank, as well in conjunction with the food you're going to add to the tank once or twice a week. Um, you know, when you're feeding your fish, as you know, they get excited, they swim everywhere, they chase the food down, and some of them, especially tangs, will poop into the water, and that poop blows around everywhere, right? The clam will get some of that as well. So it's getting some food even from the waste of your fish. And it's getting some of the food that blows through the tank that it happens to capture. But it's got to be very, very fine food for the clam. And that's why it can't be something like krill or mysis or brine shrimp. These are all too big. It has to be plankton-sized stuff. Uh, William says, I want you to build me a sump similar to yours. How far behind are you with orders? I'm not that far behind, but um, I'm heading into surgery next month. And then I'm going to have to take about a six-week break. So um, if you're hoping to get something done, there's a chance I can get it done during this month, hopefully. Uh, you just can reach out to me through my, my web page. So I guess I'll throw that on the screen since we're talking about supporting Mila's Reef. Let me get over here. Please support Mila's Reef and uh, buy things. I appreciate every time you guys do an order, I'm like, wow, they bought something for me. That's awesome. And I always appreciate it. And I, um, I fill orders as quickly as I can. A few orders came in this week. And I emailed each of those people saying your order goes out next week because I was out of town. I only got home about an hour ago from a trip I was just gone on. And uh, I am back to work. <laughs> so uh, I'll do my best to get all these orders out that have recently hit. And I'm still catching up on a couple of one uh, big custom orders. But other than that, it's not that bad. It's just I think everyone kind of knows the surgery's coming. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I do appreciate when you guys shop from my website and it really does help make ends meet. So thank you so much for that support. <laughs> GMAC says, if you like clams, spike that like button. I like it. Like. <laughs> um... So a scallop is a different type of filter feeder, and they can live a decent amount of time, but historically, you know, just in general, they're not long-lived animals in our tanks. And I think that was because our tanks were too filtered, <clears throat> and the flame scallop couldn't catch enough food. So the fact that you've been able to keep one for nine months or so is great. If you could keep it for a few years, that'd be even better. And yes, Definitely dosing phytoplankton on a regular basis, which you could do daily, would not be harmful. And I do know in the past when I dosed phytoplankton to my tank on a regular basis, my glass didn't get as green. It's like the phyto in the, t in the water did something to where I wouldn't get as much film algae on the glass, which was kind of cool. And Myers Reefs and Pets says that mushrooms are growing on my clamshell. It hasn't affected or harmed it, and it looks pretty cool. Yeah, it won't hurt it, and they will peel off. They won't hold on super tight. So if you, at some point, wanted to remove it, you can. Oh, this is nice. Andy says that he's got a flame angel, a gold flake angel, and a valentini puffer that leave the clam alone. So um, he says, I do feed heavily, so maybe they're nice and fat and happy, and so they're not picking at things that we care about. Um, Ellery is mentioning Perkinsis, which I'm not familiar with that term. So I am just going to say, I'm just going to put it on the screen for you guys to see. It was a discussion over on Reef to Reef in the clam thread area. Clams and urchins get along just fine. So you don't have to worry about them not getting along. They'll do just what they need to do. And uh, the urchin may even clean off the shell of the clam especially if some kind of algae is taking place. Can a clam tolerate an anemone? Yes, it can. Um, 
the anemone's tentacles may get near it and touch it. In that one picture I showed you, I had that large one that split into pieces right next to the clam, and the clam didn't move away. The, the anemone didn't seem to do anything. It, it, was, it was like nothing was going on. I think because the tentacles couldn't touch the mantle. They were just touching the shell when it really expanded out. So yes, that should be just fine. Mr. Reefbuster, you're supposed to be working. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. Zach, what size is your Gigas clam? <clears throat> I'd love to know. Uh, Scott says that his cell phone tang nips at his, man his clam's mantle from time to time, no matter how much food he puts in the tank. So there is a chance that that, that could happen to you as well. Um... Puddle Aquatics says, hey Mark, how are things, uh, well, get to, I wanted to ask, what does it cost per month in electric, uh, electricity to run your entire system? I know you run Meta Halide, so I was thinking it's fairly high. Actually, it's not nearly that high. Uh, that's kind of a, people will just throw out certain numbers that make absolutely no sense. Like they will say, if you, get metal halide bulbs, your electric bill will go up $200 a month. And that's based on nothing. There's, there's no physical measuring of wattage, kilowatt rates, hours of the day, um, you know, because all of those come into factor. My own tank, I've done the math a couple of times. I do these uh, electric analyses of my system from time to time, and they're on my website in the blog area. But um, I think last time I checked it, I'm somewhere between $65 and $85 a month for the entire system of anything that's saltwater related that's running. So anything plugged in that turns on for any time period whatsoever, whether it's pumps or heaters or skimmers or circulation pump like on the saltwater vat, the frag system with all of its associated gear, anything plugged in the wall, I measured it, took my price per kilowatt hour, and it came up with a, a price that's somewhere around $65 to 85 bucks. And uh, I live in a house with two bathrooms. I have utilities, you know, I have washer dryer, I have dishwasher, uh, oven, stove, it's all electric. I don't have any gas, so I'm paying electricity for everything. And my bill last month was somewhere around $200, including my craziness that is behind me. So uh, I don't think it's that bad. But if I was trying to do this exact same thing in California, where the kilowatt rates are seven times higher, it could cost a lot more. But then I know a lot of hobbyists in California that would run their tanks from 6 p.m., like 6.01 p.m., until like 2 in the morning because the rates are much cheaper at night than they are during the daytime. And uh, so deregulation didn't work so great in California. In, uh, in Texas, it did work out in our favor, and I have a very good rate. I think I'm paying somewhere around 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour, so I don't have to really worry about it. And then, I, you know, I did all the other things people do to save money. I changed lights in my house. All my bulbs are now LEDs and stuff. So there's that. But it's not horribly costly. Even my return pump uses very little power. My NIO skimmer, those little pumps use very little power. You know, it's just, they're not big energy hogs like we used to use, where we'd get some huge pool pump, and we would run it, and it would be, you know, 400 watts of power just to keep your return pump running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. Uh, that was, you know, like $25 a month for that one pump. And uh, now I've got three metal halides on there, and they're each running seven hours, and they're pulling 400 watts, basically, per bulb. And uh, so you got 1,200 watts I'm using for seven hours. Do the math there, do it times that. I think that comes out to like $15 a month in metal halides. So I hope that answered your question. Michael, I cannot answer your question because I'm not a fish disease guy. 
All I can say is if all the fish in your tank have died, keep the tank fallow, which means fishless, for like another 12 weeks to 16 weeks, and then you can introduce new fish because whatever was in there will be gone. And that's if I'm right. <laughs> I am not a fish disease guy. This comes every week. People ask me a question about fish disease, ick, velvet. I don't, it's not my subject. I just don't know it. So Reef to Reef has a really good uh, fish disease forum, reeftoreef.com. Um, there's a person in there named Humblefish that seems to answer a lot of questions, and that is who I point everyone to when they have a fish disease question. Uh, Michael says, can you use, or I don't know if it's a question or a statement, but can you use, or you can use, the bottom of a two liter bottle with a hole, and you can, fill, you can actually squirt the phyto into that area? Yes, you can do that. What I would recommend if you're going to do the, like the, the feeding dome over a clam, make sure it's big enough. Um, and I would actually use the top of it rather than the bottom, because I like the, the way it comes to a spout. And I'll drill some holes in there, so that way it can't lose the oxygen within while it's doming and then you can squirt in your phyto and you can do it multiple times because you're going to squirt it in the clam's going to start absorbing it and some of it's going to bleed out through the little holes just because they flow in the tank and you can put in a little bit more and a little bit more but uh got to get that dome back out so you don't starve the clam of oxygen Uh, Corey says, in passing a while back, you mentioned using Seachem Prime in a reef. Can you elaborate? Seachem Prime is a magical elixir. I have no idea what the ingredients are, but it is something that locks up ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, chlorine, chloramine. I mean, it's just, it's a great safety net if things are going wrong in your tank. If something is really wrong, you can add a capful per 50 gallons to help lock things up while you're fixing whatever's wrong. And when I say by really wrong, Things are starting to die. Uh, you're pulling out things that are already dead. Uh, the water has turned milky for some reason, and you're just trying to save what's left. Adding prime can help lock up all those uh, ammonias and, and the toxicity that is rising in the water to help get your livestock out of there and into uh, a hospital tank or a quarantine tank or, or a Rubbermaid vat or whatever you're going to move it to. But uh, I don't use it like on a regular basis. I don't. I buy a new bottle every single year. I never trust an old bottle because I just feel like I, I, I heard a story. So I just believe that what he said was true, that the bottle had expired and the contents um, ended up being what un it didn't save his reef when everything was going to hell. <laughs> and so he said, I wish I'd had a new bottle. And so every year I buy one fresh bottle. It doesn't cost much. Maybe it's 10, 12 bucks and I stick it under the, the uh, anemone cube. And if something were to happen, I've got it ready. It's just an emergency thing. Um, you can also use it with your RODI water if you wanted. If you were concerned with chloramines in your area, there was a summer here where Texas had such a bad drought that our water, something was different. You just knew it. You could smell it. You could taste it. It just was not normal. And I started adding it to my water automatically. I'd fill this thing up with water and I'd add a cap full of prime and nothing weird happened in my tank. And I was down at the fish store, and Frank said he was doing the exact same thing with his water because he knew about the drought. Because what happens when the water gets really low, the water table drops in Texas, um, it's dirtier water. I guess it's more concentrated, and the city is actually adding more stuff, including chloramines, to keep it healthy or safe for us for human consumption, but that doesn't make it safe for, for reef tanks. So by adding prime to the water, that was one way that we protected our systems and so all of his customers were getting water that they could use in their homes like when they buy jugs of water it all had prime in it and you know once summer you know was over and rains came back and the the drought was lifted we went right back to not using it so it's just something nice to know ah, i see antonio is here hello vivid creative aquatics that is his flow accelerator that he 3d printed Glenn says, how's your neck this week? <laughs> <clears throat> eh, 
I took a lot of pills this week. It's doing fine. So thank you for asking. Um, I've had to do my best to avoid some serious headaches. Let's see. Okay. What's the best way to keep good levels of nitrifying bacteria? I'm using dry rock, bare bottom with ultra low nutrients. I just feel like there's not enough bacteria. There's a good chance there's not. You, know, you're, you may be absolutely right. Uh, you can add something to your tank on a weekly basis, like Microbacter 7. Um, there's some other products. I just read about something brand new coming out from Brightwell that is like super concentrated and even can be used to help cycle a tank more quickly than the typical, I believe, wait three weeks. And they're saying, you know, you could cycle it in five to eight days, I believe it was. It was a quick email. I didn't memorize it. But it's something brand new coming to market. And so it's going to be a really dense culture of bacteria. Uh, I don't know if that would work in your situation, you know, it, but it's nice to know that we have more and more options. I do know that the Benary food that I use has bacteria in it. And then, of course, I've mentioned Live Rock Enhance and Reef Enhance. Both, well, Reef Enhance is a food. Live Rock Enhance is a bacteria that helps to denitrify and to eat and consume waste in your tank. And so when you put that in two times a week, that will actually buffer up your bacteria levels as well. <clears throat> so those are some of the things that I consider could work. And they're simple to use. Now they mention my neck, it's starting to hurt. <laughs> of course. Thanks for reminding me. Let's see. <clears throat> Luke says, um, I'm setting up a new tank. Uh, is it okay if I add tangs first and the RAS later so my pod population can grow? Yeah, you can. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. The uh, tangs will be helping with algae control to some degree, even though they won't eat at all. They'll just eat some of it, and then they're going to start liking the food you give them. Um, and then the RAS, you can add it later when the tank is suitable for a RAS. Uh, it is a chance that the RAS will eat as many pods as it can find, and even worms. And then at some point, it's going to hopefully switch over to the foods you offer and less of the pods. Because once you've got your tangs and your RAS, what if you want a mandarin? Or you want a scooter blenny? You know, or you know, some other creature in those families that likes to eat pods? So you, you know, that's the challenge. If you get too many rasses in the tank, you might limit yourself and not even be able to have uh, those pot-eating fish that you might have thought would be cool to add. So if you're going with rasses, maybe you go with lots of rasses and you forego on the other types of fish like gobies and dragonets. I'm trying to think what else eats pods. <laughs> Scott says, my squamosa has gone through an alkalinity swing that was up and down and after a lovely dose of Febreze, thanks to my little one. Yeah, keep the uh, cleaning supplies out of your tank. And yes, we have to keep an eye on our kids at all times, make sure they're not doing anything. And then Tom says, you know, my Maxima kept jumping down back to the sand bed. They're fine on the sand bed. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I know in nature they can be on rock, but they can be just as fine on sand and most, I actually prefer them down at the bottom because that way when I get up on top of my uh, walkboard and I'm looking down at my reef, I'm seeing the clams against the white backdrop of the sand and it's beautiful and it's great for taking pictures too. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Macy, that was very polite of you to say that. So I'm going to say it out loud. This is better than all the college games today and there's some really good ones on. So thanks for enjoying the live stream. Um, are there any good products that are safe to clean the outside glass of the tank? You know, the <clears throat> simplest thing to use that a lot of people like to use is Windex. And you can definitely use it on the outside of your glass tank. I would just spray it onto the towel and then rub the glass down. That way you're not spraying toward the tank and toward the filtration. Uh, you can also use vinegar and water. You can just use just water. You can use RODI water. Um, and that will clean off most anything off the glass. There's also products that different companies make made for aquarium glass and even made for aquarium that are made of acrylic 
that you can use to polish your glass and make it pretty. I, when I was cleaning my old tank, I had a newspaper subscription, and I would use newspaper and Windex, and the oils and the ink would make the glass nice and slippery and shiny. But then some product came to market years ago that Frank was selling that was this really, really great glass cleaner, and it was, it was like uh, Rain-X, <laughs> in that what it did was your glass was clean, you could see through it perfectly, and it was slippery, so your cleaning magnet would glide so much more readily back and forth, where, and then at some point, the company, I guess Frank was doing such a good selling it, because it said something like reptile cage cleaner, and they said, well, we're gonna make a new label that says, you know, aquarium glass cleaner. And he's like, okay, I don't care. And so then they changed the label, and then they tried to charge more per bottle, and he says, I'm not gonna sell it for that. And they're like, but we pay for these labels. He says, I don't care, I didn't even ask you to do that. I could have sold Reptile Cage Cleaner for the rest of my life and been happy. I just knew it worked really well. And he ended up parting ways. And so I lost that source for a really cool glass cleaner. But um, there's some other stuff on the market. Fritz has one that I've used that works pretty well. And uh, you can always make something. There's some, I'm sure there's some homeopathic glass cleaner out there where you can use tea tree oil and, <laughs> I don't know, tree sap in order to clean your glass. I don't know. But... Uh, I've used Windex many times. I've never, never once even was slightly worried. But on a, I would never use that on acrylic because it could crazy acrylic. So that's why vinegar and water is another choice. And then Scott says, is it normal for them to move around? Yes. They can be in one spot for a very long time and then suddenly they just decide they want to be somewhere else. And when they are up against the glass, it kind of ruins your view because now they're facing into the reef and away from your eyeballs. And so you can't appreciate it and you can't use your cleaning magnet now. You may have to actually kind of nudge it back where it needs to be and maybe get lucky. Or like I said, put it inside an empty clamshell so it's secure on that and it lets you put it where you want it. Um, Antonio says, I had a clam once that was infected with the pyramidellid snails. And <clears throat> is it possible for the snails to continue to exist even if the clam is gone. Yes, because they can keep snacking on snails. So you're gonna have to look really closely at your snail population, your astrias, your um, trochus snails, and look around you know, the opening where the foot is and see if there's lots of little tiny snails, those little tiny pyrams. They could be boring into the snails and eating those to stay alive. But if you see them on the clam, you can just basically knock them off the clam and that's the end of it. I, and like I would do it over a bowl of water in the kitchen. I would just be working there, and then I would put the clam back in the tank. And True Reef says he bought a clam a month ago after six years, and it's doing great. That's awesome. Rosano, how exactly did that happen? Was it stinging the mantle? Because that's the thing. If it's able to touch the meaty part of the clam, I could see how the nematocysts of an anemone could cause the damage. Um, this one, I don't know what it is. I'd have to Google it to figure out what you're asking me, so I'm gonna skip past it. Tip and Turtle, you're very welcome. I'm glad that you're enjoying these while you're working on your tank. We should all be working on our tanks. Uh, I might as well mention at this junction that today is one day before my reef turning six years old. So tomorrow is the anniversary of a six-year-old reef tank. So I'm going to be working on it today, make sure it's nice and clean, get some video, and do a big tour on film that I will then be uploading tomorrow for the anniversary. So you have a video to look forward to tomorrow. And that will be the six-year anniversary of the tank. And it's gonna be not just showing you close-ups of everything in there, but it's also gonna show you all the different gear that has changed, you know, even plumbing has changed, over the last 12 months since the last anniversary video. I do one every single year. And uh, I, a lot of people like that because it gives them a rundown of everything in one video. So you can look forward to that. Um, PTAC, Nick, hard to say that out loud. Do you do frag tanks? I sent plans for frag tank, but I didn't hear back. Uh, I might not have seen the email. Uh, so feel free to send it again, and I'll take a look at it. Do you have the pump for the vacuum attachment? I have one MaxiJet in stock. It's a MaxiJet 600. Uh, it'll fit that. Uh, most people want the MaxiJet 1200. I don't have any in stock right now. 
but you can get that from uh, everywhere, <laughs> including your fish store. Ashley says, I've just started watching, but do you know anything about what a marine biologist do? Specifically? Nope. I think a lot of them study a specific field and they'll put their focus into one thing, like urchins, for example, and that will be their extent of their knowledge in that area. Or maybe they pursue something else, you know, like with whales. And that leads them to jobs possibly like whale care at SeaWorld. Something to those degrees. I don't know. It's actually one of the things that I kind of wish when I was in my 20s, I wish I'd considered studying marine biology because then, I don't know, I'd have some kind of initials after my name. <laughs> But I didn't. I instead worked and took care of my family. So uh, it's just one of those things. It wasn't something on my mind at that time. And then later I got so deep into this hobby, you'd think that's totally what I should have done. And oh well, opportunity missed. Uh, Tippin says, are you still running your bio pellets? No, I haven't run bio pellets in probably three years. Ah, minimum par for an average clam. Oh, I'd say 120 would be the absolute minimum. Uh, 120 to 200 is pretty common on most reef tanks down at the sand bed. Um, it would probably do better under a more intense lighting, a little bit higher up in the rock work, if you can get it to stay there. <laughs> Mateus says, my urchin loves the shell of my clam. The funniest thing is watching the urchin gets too close to the outflow, and then the clam closes and the urchin gets shot nearly two feet down the tank. <laughs> get off of me! Quit touching me! Yeah, Andrea, thank you very much for reminding everyone to post those pictures of the clams you have in Club Miller's Reef. Hi, Adnan. So, um... In a few weeks, I am flying to Dubai to see Adnan and his friends. That will be very cool. And I'll come back with some footage. Uh, Rosano says, I'm starting to get some slime in my RODI reservoir. Is there anything I can do to prevent it? Yes, you can clean it. So you're going to want to take your reservoir and you're going to want to clean it with bleach water, which would be 10 parts water to one part bleach. And you scrub down the walls, you... If you have any kind of pump with tubing, leave it in that solution and let it just circulate for a long time and then take it apart, clean everything off, and rinse it all really well, rinse the container really well, let it air out for 24 hours, and then you can restart or refill it with RODI water and that should remove all of that stuff. And you'll probably end up having much nicer or lower TDS water afterwards. If you're getting slime in your container, odds are the TDS is actually quite high in that container. Hello, Mega Wolf. <laughs> Tyler says, uh, I replaced my DI cartridge with a cheaper brand. It went from zero to two. How is this possible? I don't know. Um, it could be that that number will go back down again if it's a brand new DI cartridge. Uh, it could be a result of TDS creep where you're not letting run for two minutes before you even start the DI. <clears throat> it could be the water is channeling through the resin rather than going through it properly, which means, for example, if your DI was horizontal and the resin's lying here and the water's flowing over the top, it's not going through the resin, it's going over it. So that's why I always like to have them vertical. <clears throat> if the resin was dry, um, it dried out, it won't be effective. Whenever you buy DI resin, it should be moist and you want to make sure that it stays moist, and that way uh, when you install it and use it, it'll be effective and it'll work. But two is not a number to worry about. 10, 12, 18, 20, that's a number to worry about. But anything under four or five, you know, I usually don't sweat it. You know, yeah, I like zero, and it can be zero for a very long time, and then it finally says one, and it says one for a real long time, and then it says two, and I'm like, all right, you know, and then finally three or four, I'm like, all right, fine, let me change out the DI. But uh, a, a number super low, like two, it's not something to worry about right now. I'll keep an eye on it and see if it gets better or if it gets worse. If it gets worse, you should replace it with another one, um, whoever you want to use. I sell them as well. Ah, 
I see a follow-up. I put one of yours in and boom, it's back to zero. Well, there you go. I have the good stuff. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. Um, <clears throat> oh, there's another uh, pot eater. Thank you. So our two pot eaters, such as the mandarin and the pipefish, too much for a 22-gallon tank with a hang-on-back refugium? Probably not, but you'll probably want to replenish those pods. Also, you probably want to use something like Reef Enhance. And the reason I mentioned that is because when I was talking with Tulio about that product and saying, you know, well, you know, what's it do? Because it just says it enhances a reef. He said, do you like pods? And I said, yeah, I like pods. He goes, well, would you like more? I'm like, sure. He goes, use Reef Enhance. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and he just said, you know, just keep in mind, it's going to make everything grow. I was like, well, that's good. And he says, no, everything. So in other words, he's saying if you have pests, you'll have more pests. If you have pods, you have more pods. If you have uh, coral, you have more coral. You know, so I mean, everything is growing in abundance because of the availability of this food. But uh, he was definitely promoting that you'll have more pods in your tank if you use Reef Enhancer on a regular basis. Well, that was a pretty interesting point. Um, Andrea says, is there any problem to having a clam and running ozone? No, that shouldn't be a factor at all. If anything, the water be more clear, there'd be better light penetration and increased PAR, which should help the clam. Um, ozone is adding an extra oxygen molecule. It's also helping your skimmer be more effective. So there's that, but you can feed more, which will take care of the needs of the clam. So I don't see that being a, a major factor. I don't I'm, I know there are systems out there, public aquariums, that have huge clams, and they're running ozone, they're running UV, you know, they're running skimmers, they're dosing with caulkwasser, you know, so, yeah, it should be, shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> Kaneshi says, I'm very new to the hobby and was very overwhelmed when I saw so many people at the local fish store, including you. A bit starstruck at the moment, just wanted to say hi. Uh, you know, that's great. I'm glad you were there and that we uh, got to run into each other and hang out and talk because that's the whole point. And I am just a normal guy that loves reefs and I talk about them all day long. And uh, I'm always here to answer questions and help you guys be more successful with your tanks. And I love hanging out in a fish store when I have the free time. And I don't do it often enough. I used to do it a lot more. But I just, I, I'm trying to get things knocked out, especially with all, <laughs> I don't want to start ranting about my back, but when I have a few good hours, I want to work as quick as I can before I have bad hours. You know, once angry neck kicks in, I, I stop working. And uh, I've been trying really, really hard, and I've done really good at catching up with everybody. And uh, I, I just hope to continue to do that. And then, of course, have my surgery, fix my neck, make it even better, and then I'll be 100% mark again, and all will be well. That's my hope. Thank you, Adnan. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Um, Sonny, <clears throat> I might. I might. I don't know. <laughs> I have a copper band, and... I was kind of in the mood to get a clam, and then somebody mentioned it. I was like, oh, yeah, butterfly. Hmm. Maybe I'll get lucky. Uh, I, I can tell you this. I have a copper band somewhere in here. I don't see her. Maybe she's in the back right now. And I also have three filter clams that she has not touched. So since she's not touching those, maybe she won't care about a beautiful blue Maxima. <laughs> <laughs> or a beautiful gold Maxima. I don't know. But uh, who knows? Uh, I do want to tell you guys a little bit about... So last weekend, we didn't do the live stream, as you guys know. And uh, we did a bus tour, and we went to four different local fish stores. And every store I went to, I bought something for my tank. So I shared some pictures on Instagram, which then, of course, propagated over onto Facebook. And one of them was a new uh, Fabia, a Jason Fox Fabia that was really pretty. I swore it was a chalice until I got a really good look at it. I was like, oh, it is a Fabia. I got uh, a Fabia. I mean, uh, this one's a chalice, and it got blown over while I was out of town. I got to stand it back up where it belongs. And apparently it has sweepers and will kill its neighbors. So uh, I've got quite a bit of footage from the bus tour. That will be another video I'll be working on here this week. 
I'd like to release it as well because it just happened. And then I want to start working on these old videos that I've been talking about forever that I've never gotten done. I want to just get back to editing. And we're heading into the season where that should happen. Shane, thanks for letting me know that the ATO reservoir is working out great. And yes, you do need to install a siphon block. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> all right, MJ Simple Reefer says, I have an issue with nitrates in my system at 60, or it's a 60 gallon system. There's two fish, I don't feed much, but nitrates are high. I need to know what that number actually is, but let's just pretend your number is a hundred. <laughs> um, and it's a 60 gallon tank. So the tank's been set up for two years and I have a bunch of bio balls in my sump. Could this be the cause? Yes, bio balls make nitrate. Wet, dry uh, sumps where the water trickles through bio balls makes nitrate. I have an article on my website that's how to knock down nitrates. And one of the things it says is to remove bio balls, bio bale, bio wheels, um, pads, all those things that trap organics and sit there and rot and waste are adding to the nitrate problem. And so if you are trying to get your nitrates down, you've got to remove the bio balls. Now, we don't want to shock your system, so what you're going to want to do is take out 25% once a week for four weeks until they're all gone and not use bio balls anymore. Not use the wet dry part of it anymore. So instead you're going to change your plumbing to where the water drains lower and maybe that spot where you had the bio balls, possibly you can make some kind of a stand of some kind, or I can, and then you can put a protein skimmer on it and that way you can have a skimmer working on the system and not rely on bio balls. Bio balls were used many, many years ago specifically for fish only systems. And uh, it was just, it's old technology that somehow is still alive to this date, but it doesn't benefit us. Maybe it benefits freshwater people a whole bunch, but for saltwater, it does not benefit a reef tank whatsoever. And this is a reef channel. So I would say uh, get rid of the bio balls and then it's a 60 gallon tank. If you do a 30 gallon water change several times in a row, you will cut your nitrate in half, half, half. So in other words, I said nitrates are 100 because I make, made up a number. And then you do a 30 gallon water change, nitrates will be 50. And you do a 30 gallon water change, nitrates will be 25. And you do another 30 gallon water change and nitrates will be 12 and a half. And that would be all like every two days. 30 gallon water change, two days. 30 gallon water change, two days. So you're changing 120 gallons of water in a week's time, and you will knock them from 100 to 12.5, and they'll stay down now that the bio balls are gone. So if you're doing small water changes like 5, 10, 15 gallons, you're not going to make much progress. It's just going to stay in there. And nitrate is in the water, and so we're trying to get it out by changing the water. Uh, Linda says, I had a clam infested with Pyrrhum snails, and it wasn't just a matter of removing them, but they're eggs. You know, that's funny that you mention that, because I've never seen eggs. All I've seen is Pyrrhums make smaller Pyrrhums, so it's like more of these little tiny snails, and you just had to knock them all off. Um, but the fact that you had that many to the point where the clam died, it, it's a shame, but uh, I'd never heard they have eggs. Uh, I'm not going to say they can't, because it's a snail, and snails lay eggs but I've only always seen little shells. I've seen large ones to itty bitty tiny ones, but I've never seen the eggs, so that's news to me. Thanks for letting me know. Um, Aceur says, I'm pretty new to all this. Is there a general par range that SPS will grow under? Um, minimum. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Hush. <laughs> A uh, minimum of 150, maximum of six, 700. That would be kind of that range. And we tend to put our SPS up high in the tank, so that's going to be the higher intensity light. And as you get deeper in the tank, as you go deeper, 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 the par just drops off more and more quickly. And that's why you'll be down at the sand. It might only be 100. It might be 90. It might be 80. Like this corner over here measures about 80 in my tank, and there's Duncans right there. But all my SPS is under here where it's going to be three, four, five hundred par uh, for the SPS corals to thrive on. Yep, 
Yet Reef says, what is your dream clam? And I'd just say, Maxima. <laughs> I really just enjoy the Maximas. I, I wouldn't mind having a bunch of them again. It's been a while. I also need to find a great spot for them. Uh, I've got this corner on the back side here that I start putting all my acans in, and I can't wait for that to fill in. If I wanted to do clams, I don't know. I'd have to put one like right there maybe. That might be a great spot actually. <laughs> and Brad, you're right. And while I'm healing and I'm not working, maybe I can sit at a desk and edit. Um, problem is I narrate and I may not have much of a voice after they've moved my <laughs> vocal cords over while they worked in there. I, I don't, I, I do know I had a sore throat and I think that allows me to have more ice cream, which means I'll be even fatter than I am now. And oh my God, I am so annoyed at my gut right now. I just want it gone and I'm doing nothing to remove it. So, but yeah, I am looking forward to getting more videos out to you guys. Matter of fact, okay, uh, quick question. Or maybe I should just say it's going to happen. Um, last year, year and a half ago, something like that, I did a lot of videos for you, for uh, Facebook. And they usually were a short topic and then I answered questions. Sometimes it was just questions that I was actually answering that were leftovers from YouTube live chats that got ignored or, or, or got missed. So I'd answer them over there. Well, not all of you are on Facebook. And there's a chance some of you never saw those videos. So I was thinking about re-releasing those here on YouTube for you to see. Now, it'll be a little weird because you'll hear me saying things like, come follow me on YouTube, because it was a made-for-Facebook video. But uh, at the time when I was making them, you know, they, they serve their purpose, but they're just sitting on my hard drive, and there's, you know, 55,000 of you on this channel. I feel like I need to, like, bring them over here in case you missed it. So what do you guys think about that? Should I drop them on here? You know, I don't know, do some kind of give you a clue in the title, like topic, parentheses, FB, so you know it was a Facebook video. I don't know. Or just do it and hope you guys figure it out. <laughs> I, I never want to be confusing. I just try, maybe I'll make a playlist and the playlist will be like Facebook videos. I don't know. I, what do you guys think? What should I do? I just, I might as well upload them. I'll give you something to watch that you may have missed already. And you know, I've got probably 15 of them. So that'd be kind of cool. You have to let me know. So feel free to post in the comments later today. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for posting the link to the nitrate article. And uh, Yet Reef asked the question about Neceria snails are laying eggs. Is there anything you can do to make them hatch? No, and they're not going to survive more than likely. Typically, things in your tank will eat it, or your filtration will get it, or your flow will get them. It's very rare to successfully have them. Um, usually people that grow snails, what happened was they laid eggs in the refugium and there's no predators of any kind and the flow is slow in there and you'll end up with tons of these little snails like, oh, I grew a whole bunch, who wants some? Which is really neat. And uh, that does happen from time to time. But in our reef tank, there's just so much going on and there's so much activity and everyone's looking for something to snack on. And you know, at first you'll see the egg sac and you'll see the eggs getting a little bit bigger and suddenly the egg sac is empty, and then the egg sac's even gone. You're like, well, where did it all go? Because I didn't do anything. So uh, typically you're not going to have luck with them coming back. Ah, thank you for telling me how to say your name. <laughs> Sometimes the spellings, I'm like, you need to buy a vowel. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Robert, I may have answered an email to you a week ago about this exact topic. People keep asking me if I can make a peacemaker that's also a fish trap, and I can't. I make two different devices because they serve two different purposes. And the simplest way to explain it is that the fish trap is going to be in your tank for three days, and you're trying to catch, or, or 30 minutes, depending on how good you are. And you put the trap in, you catch the fish, and you take the trap out full of water like a vase, with a fish swimming in the bottom, probably very erratically because it's upset, and you can then pour it into a bucket or bring it up to the fish store, you know, that kind of thing. Where the peacemaker is a box with a bunch of holes so that there's plenty of oxygen and flow going through it. And if I were to put a bunch of holes in a fish trap, when you try and lift it out, it's going to have water gushing out everywhere, which is just a huge mess. So that's why my fish traps are designed to where you 
you've caught the fish, you've got the door shut, and you'll stand it up, and now the fish is in the bottom, can't escape, you can lift it out of the tank, and you can go to the kitchen with it, or wherever you're going to go. Where the Peacemaker, it's got all those holes, and it's designed to hang in the tank for a few days, and you put the fish in. So I don't do the combination. Plus, if there was like a door on the side of a Peacemaker, and the door opened somehow, and it just swam out, you'd be upset that it didn't stay in there. So I, that's why my stuff is separated. I don't do these multi things that you're asking about. And if that wasn't your email, it's a coincidence because somebody asked pretty much the exact same thing and I pretty much answered it word for word what my email said. Hey, congratulations on getting the new smart TV. I just heard, I read an article that said that some smart TVs are not smart enough and I believe they said this December certain Samsung TVs will no longer play the Netflix app and it just no more support so you can't do it but if you have a device that has Netflix in it like an Apple TV that's plugged into your smart TV you can still do it but the the app built into the television itself that some people like to rely on is gonna uh, lose the support that it was getting and it, that was just one example, and there's others out there too. Things like Hulu and, and so forth, they're, they're not supporting the ones built into TVs. More and more of us have something on our set-top you know, that we can download apps into. So, there you go. Uh, Fisher Jammin says, I just joined. Are there lights that grow corals well but give corals good colors, or vice versa? Is it a case of good colors that automatically mean good growth? Oh, such a loaded question. All right. Um, lighting comes in two different ways. So right now, this side of my tank, even in this video, is kind of white. To my eye, it's very white. It looks like I'm looking at corals under the sunlight. This side of my tank right now is blue, which essentially looks blue to you, I guess. And it makes the corals look prettier to my eye. It doesn't make them grow as fast. That's why my tank goes through a cycle of sunlight moving across to blue light for the rest of the day. And I get the growth from the sunlight, and then I get the colors from the blue light. So a lot of the light fixtures we buy these days will let you pick certain time periods of the day and certain spectrums of color. And you can say, I want my tank to be 10,000 Kelvin, 11,000 Kelvin, 12,000 Kelvin for this many hours. And then around this period of the day, it's going to switch to like 18,000 Kelvin, 20,000 Kelvin, 22,000, or whatever number you go to, and add more of the, the deeper blues and fuchsia and, uh, and uh, azure and uh, purple. You know, they really go into that really crazy disco color, which makes things glow. Like this coral right now was very expensive. I know you can't see it, it's just a dot. It's about this big. And it doesn't look like anything right now, but tonight at 9.30, that thing's going to be amazing. <laughs> and it is every single night, and of course it is every morning because my, my day starts with that blue. But I do the daylight to get the growth. And so I have a video about lighting your reef that you might want to watch. And uh, it's a pretty long video because it goes into staggered lighting. It talks about metal halide versus LEDs. Um, more and more people are getting hybrid lights now where they get LEDs and T5s because they get a better spread and less shadowing. Uh, certain light fixtures tend to give you a disco effect where you see red, blue, red, blue, red, blue on the sand bed. It's very distracting. Other light fixtures don't do that. Uh, Radeon has come out with diffusers to help make the light spread a little bit more. Kessel came out with something to actually bring the beam tighter together so it's not splashing out over the edges of the, t of the tank and into the room. So, I mean, there's so much to this question it's its own topic, and odds are I've talked about lighting in at least one or two live streams. So you could do that, but I would watch the How Long Should You Run Your Lights video on this channel, and I think you'll get a lot of good information from that. Oh, that's a good one. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, I could do original air date for the different videos I made, and that way when they come over, you, you know what they are or why they're dated the way they are. That, that could work. Yeah, I just need to do something where it's kind of obvious. Okay, great. I'm glad you guys are looking forward to that. A, a whole bunch of people said yes to it. So. Uh, Diacanthus Reef says, 
that pyramid snail eggs masses are clear, which is probably why I never saw any, and they're close as, as close as possible to the mantle, which makes total sense because as they hatch, they need to be near food. Um, and I've noticed more prolific numbers near the bissel opening, which is the base of the crocias, and they're nocturnal, which totally makes sense. So, yeah. But uh, once they get big enough, you can see them to remove them. And I mean, they come off with tweezers. They come off with uh, skewers, like if you were making a shish kebab, those wooden sticks with a point. That's what we did. We just flicked them off the, the clam, put the clam back in. I went to the fish store, to Frank's, and he had a clam covered in those snails, and I took a picture, which is on Critter ID. And then after I was done taking the pictures, <laughs> he took the clam out, knocked them all off, put it back in. And I used to visit that clam every week, and that clam did great. It just, the pests were just on there. It was sort of like pulling hermit crabs off of something. It's not like a, like a flatworm problem where you can never get ahead of it. They're, they're visible, you see them, you remove them. And if some eggs were to hatch into larger ones, you remove them again, and that's it. Because you're going to get them while they're still juvenile enough, they didn't have a chance to lay even more eggs. They're not that type of a pest where they can just lay eggs like crazy, like a lionfish. You know, the lionfish epidemic that's going on in Florida waters and, well, everywhere. They say these lionfish lay 200,000 eggs at a time. Is there any wonder we can't seem to reduce their population? I mean, they're literally like roaches in the Keys. They are everywhere. And they're eating everything. And they are a big problem. Purim snails, they're not a big deal. You see them, you knock them off, literally knock them off the shell and uh, move on with your life. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, but if you needed something to help keep your clam clean, huh, I wish I thought of this an hour ago. I could have mentioned it. Small wrasses are really good at keeping clams clean. Uh, so if you have some type of clam in your tank, get yourself a little tiny yellow coarse wrasse, and it will pick at anything that's on the clam shell that doesn't belong, and it'll eat it. Uh, I think the green leaf wrasse may do as well. A six-line wrasse could do it, but six-line wrasses are bullies. So you could go with a four line or an eight line, which apparently are not bullies. And so you got those choices as well. But some of the different, uh, you know, other wrasses like the Melanurus wrasse, the Christmas wrasse, um, the, I didn't say mystery wrasse, not so helpful. I mean, they might be at first, but then they'll just start relying on your food and they will stop hunting. So I really like little tiny yellow coarse wrasses because they can get into every crevice and they can get into an acropora colony and they can get between the branches and they will find the things that need to be snacked on and devoured. Jay, I'm sorry to hear that the two times you tried to get a clam it didn't work out. Maybe next time you do it, it will. Yeah, Tim, that was exactly what I was saying. We need to put something under the clam. Another thing you can do if you don't want to put something physical under the clam, like a, a half shell, like I was suggesting, would be to get a flat piece of rock and push it down into the sand so that the sand is covering most of it and there's just a little bit of the aggregate visible and put the clam on that and the clam can grab onto it. And again, it's just, it's rock, so it's less of a likelihood that there's worms going to be coming up under the clam to get at it. But, uh... I really like the half shell system. That seemed to work really well for me. Hey, Jamie, I'm glad that, it that you received it and it's in good shape because that was exactly what I was hoping for. I, I pack the heck out of the stuff I ship. <laughs> and I just, I don't want to build it twice. You know, I want to build it good and there you go. Charles asked me, what are my thoughts on the Crocea clam? They're nice. A lot of hobbyists like them. I just don't get one myself because of their look. On the other hand, Charles loves them. <laughs> Thought it was beautiful and haven't seen any since. So yeah, you can check and see who sells them and uh, decide which one you like. I'm, I'm a Maxima guy. That's interesting, Jay, um, that they lasted three to four months. So for several months, everything was great. Uh, there's also a possibility too, you know, when the water parameters go to hell, which happens, something goes wrong, something breaks, something overdoses, something underdoses, something ran out, and our water parameters swing, you'll lose a clam. I mean, it could be that your situation was stable for months and then something hit that tipping, or the tank got too hot one day, or it got too cold one night, you know, 
So, I mean, these are things that happen. And the trick is to be stable all year long and never have a crash, you know, never have it to where things go haywire, staying ahead of it, keeping an eye on it. That's that's what I do. That's how I live and breathe this tank. I'm always watching it like a hawk. And even when I'm out of town, I have a tank sitter that comes by every day. And now I've got it set up to where I can say, everything okay? And he's like, nothing going on. I'm like, all right, good. Which is great because there's been times where he had to really deal with some issue. And fortunately this time he did not have to. Yes, Eric, you definitely do. Uh, Fisher, I did mention uh, clams in a refugium. Uh, like as filter feeders, not like beautiful clams that we enjoy. But could you put like a really nice clam in a refugium if you had enough light? So if we're using uh, one of these... And then the other thing is what color light are you using on your refugium? Because I was about to say, people are using the Kessel light, which is really pink. So you're flooding that zone with this pink-red uh, color... How, what color is the clam going to be under that? Are, are you even going to be able to appreciate it for what it is? Or is it going to look weird under that color? You know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But if you had white light, you can appreciate the clam for what it is. And you can see it from the side, you can see it from above, and you can see how the color changes depending on which way you're looking at it. And I love that about clams. Will the clam thrive in a refugium? I've never done that one. I always put them in the reef tank. But uh, if it's stable and tied into the system and good flow and good light, and the plants aren't trying to take it over, yeah, that could be done. Um, <laughs> Keith is finally here and I was just thinking in my head I think we're done <laughs> and I'm not joking I meant it I was like I think we're wrapping up hey Jason thanks for tuning in Phil you're here too Phil is here from Alaska let's see Keith, are you asking me if I have a recommendation of what kind of net to buy? A net? Uh, you know what? It's funny, uh, I have probably 10 different nets here, and I probably have even more I'm not aware of. But I really like the one where the fabric is white. It's more like a mesh rather than like physical net. Uh, I think it's better for catching some fish because it doesn't catch on their gills or catch on that spine by their cheek or uh, on their spines of their back. But... Um, I'd never see them for sale anywhere. You know, I think I got mine through a used setup. And I was at a fish store just recently looking at all their nets because I was curious, do they have the white net? You know, and they didn't. So I, I haven't checked Amazon. I should. Um, Matthew says, I have a problem with my A cans. I have four. One seems closed up. One, I think, has died. And the other two are losing all color. And I can see the skeletons. All the parameters are okay, except for magnesium is 1600. Any ideas? Well, the magnesium is 1600, and that is high. Uh, it shouldn't affect A-cans. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that there are two different kinds of A-cans. There's the A-can Lord Hoensis, and there's the A-can uh, Echinata. And Echinata is super aggressive. So like right here, that one, which you can't see, is an Echinata, and it will kill anything near it. That's why it's all by itself. And I have an Echinata in the anemone cube, uh, under the anemones, and it's down there in the corner where it can't kill anything. The Lord Hoensis, you can have them all near each other, and they love each other, and there's no problem. But since all four of your acans at the same time are showing something is wrong, the first thing I would do is I would dip them all. I would take all four and dip them in something. Uh, Revive is a coral cleaner. Um, there's one dip. There's the dip. Uh, there, people are using, uh, God. I always say to people, what's that stuff called? Bayer. Uh, the stuff you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's, uh, that's, they use it to kill pests. I don't use Bayer. So, but, and then straight iodine is another trick. Iodine mixed with some water, of course, not just straight iodine. And, uh, Tropic Marin Pro Coral Cure 
TMPCC used to be something else that we would use as a dip. That was really iodine based. And you could dip your coral for like five, 10 minutes, blow it off with a turkey baster, and then put them back in the tank and see if they heal up. Uh, I never give up on a coral like an ACAN. Even if it starts to recede and you're starting to see the skeleton, I would keep an eye on it because it could start to heal and grow more polyps and refill in again. The, the thing is that you don't want to um, ignore the situation. That's why I was suggesting the dip. But you also want to see what's going on. Maybe there's a fish in your tank that eats acans and is working on them systematically. Um, or you have an echinata next to a Lord Hoensis and the echinata is killing the other ones, you know? Or there is something in your water parameters that's not right that you think is. You mentioned magnesium was high. Well, what if your alkalinity reading that you believe is one number is actually something else entirely? Or what if you believe your salinity is right, but it's completely wrong? You know, you think it's 1.026, but it's really 1.019. You need to double check. So you gotta calibrate stuff and you gotta verify. Uh, another thing you do is you can take your water, scoop it out of your tank and go straight to the fish store and have them measure everything and then look at their numbers and then compare them to your numbers and say, okay, yeah, we agree on everything. The only thing that's different is magnesium. Then, yeah, literally your tank is just too high in magnesium. That was the thing that's irritating these corals. But high magnesium really shouldn't affect it. It tends to affect things like snails and make snails stop moving. It doesn't really affect corals. Uh, matter of fact, in the past when we had a bryopsis problem, which is a type of algae, we were told to get your magnesium from 1600 to 1800 and your corals didn't care at all, but oh, your snails just died. It just, they stopped in the track, their muscles would atrophy, they couldn't move, and they starved to death because they were frozen in time and they died. And you lost snails, which then of course led to phosphates, which led to more algae. <laughs> it was quite the process, you know? But uh, no, I don't think your magnesium is what's making these acans unhappy, it's something else. Also, if you have anything in the neighborhood of the acans, like torches, they put out long sweepers. The Hollywood Stunner Chalice puts out long sweepers. These are things that could be sweeping toward your ACAN and burning them away. So that's a possibility too. I, that ACAN Echinata in my anemone cube is near a moon favia. And the, they were neighbors and everything was great and the favia was fantastic. And then one night the ACAN just like ate, ate half of the moon favia. And I only had half left and I was really upset. And I never moved it, I ignored it, because now half of it's dead, there's a skeleton, that's the barrier, and then the living part continues to this day, and they're still really pretty, but I think I need to get my arm wet and reach in there and pluck them out and maybe put them into this tank instead, where there's no chance of that happening again. All right. Um, Rosano says, do you have an automatic generator? If not, do you have a portable one? Yes, I have a portable one. I still have not bought a full house one. I would love to do that one day. It's, it would be awesome. I, what I've got is, uh, I think it's 5,250 watts. Maybe it's listed as 6,000, but it runs 5,250. And that is enough to run the entire fish room with every outlet in that room. And I have a, I have a very specific setup that I built that when the power goes out, I kill the breaker to the entire fish room, and then I connect the generator to a sub panel that feeds just the fish room. And there's even these fuses you have to pull out. So I put those fuses in, now my generator is running it. It's a way for me to run a generator without having the fumes, because the fumes from the gasoline power were giving me headaches. And uh, I've had it like this for years. When I have to run it, I have to run it for a few hours, or for a day, or a day and a half, or I think one time we went 37 hours, that's still a day and a half, and uh, it was great. But then as soon as power comes back on, I then pull the fuses, turn off the generator, and then I flip the breaker back on to the fish room, and that brings all the power back to normal, where it comes from, from the city. But the generator works out really well. If you own a generator, you need to run it from time to time, and that's something I've been really bad about. I need to get out there, like this week, and pull on the rope and just kind of give it a run for a few minutes because they don't sit for long periods well. Ideally, you should run a generator once a month for like 20 minutes just to keep it nice and good. You wanna make sure you have fuel in there that is fresh and not old. You wanna have a fuel additive that keeps it from getting water in it. And when you turn off the generator, you don't just hit off, you actually close the gas line 
so that whatever's left in the gas line and the carburetor burns off because I made the mistake with a previous generator of just turning it off and all that gasoline in the rubber hose congealed and it, it broke the generator. And when I tried to take the hose off to clean it out, I broke the nipple off the gas tank and that was the end of that. And I went to Home Depot and said, look, I need to buy a new generator and they sold me one. And then I brought them back the one I'd broken and I told them, I said, look, I did this. Can you just send it in? Whatever it costs, it costs. I'll, I'll pay for it because I'm just going to sell it to someone in my club. And the store manager was listening to me you know, from you know, off out of sight. And he came over and goes, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I just need to fix it. So whatever it costs, it costs. And he said, but you're selling it? I said, well, I have an aquarium and I'm keeping it alive. And I just bought a new one from you guys yesterday. So I want to sell this to someone else with an aquarium and they'll save some money. And he goes, no, we're not going to do any of that. <laughs> and I was like, come on. And he goes, no, we're not doing any of that. And I was blown away with what he did. He said, what did you spend last night? I said, I spent $600. And he said, okay, let me pull up the receipt. And he did whatever he did. And then he took my generator and he found out what it was worth. And he gave me a store credit and ended up paying like a, I ended up actually paying for the new one, like $80. And they just wrote it as an RMA, which is like return to manufacturer. And that was a really cool thing I did not expect. I just thought, okay, I had to buy one. It's my own fault. I broke it. And then the other one, I'll get it fixed. And if it costs 100 or 200 to fix, I can sell it to someone for like three, 350 You know, I'll make a little bit of money on that and they'll get a generator, you know. And he said, nope, we're not going to make you go through any of that. We're not, you're not going to have to get it fixed. You're not going to have to pay to repair it. He says, you've got a new one. You're good. And uh, yeah, he did that. He swapped the receipts out basically. And I've had that generator ever since, and I'm really good about taking care of it. I wrote an article on Reef Addicts about why a generator is a must and not just an, uh, you know, a, a wish or an option. And it goes into all of this, how important it is to do that. I also um, like to do things. <laughs> I did this years ago. I had an outlet in my fish room that was just looked like an outlet on the wall. You know, it's a normal outlet, but it said on it, generator only. And if you plugged anything into it, it was dead. Because the back of it, you know, it was a blue box like they put in the sheetrock. Then it went to an extension cord. And the extension cord was just coiled up against the wall. And if I had to hook up the generator, I turned on the generator and I took the extension cord and I plugged it into the generator. And now I had two outlets on the wall I could plug things into to get power. That's what I did back then. And then when I was done, I just unplugged it from the generator and it was a dead outlet. You know, it did nothing. It, it wasn't dangerous. So there was no risk of, you know, getting in trouble or anything like that because it was more like decor. <laughs> <laughs> but when I needed to use it, it came to life. And that was better than running an extension cord through a window or a door and having to leave the window or door open slightly, especially when it's at night and you can't lock up your house. You know, I like to be able to lock the door or set the alarm. And with the cords or hoses going through a door, you can't do that. So I wanted to do something where I could actually have doors closed and still run the generator. And with my newer setup, you know, I've got it set up even better and the generator's secure so no one can steal it. Because uh, when there's a power outage, you're the noisiest guy in the neighborhood. <laughs> I hope that answered some of your question. <laughs> if I ever were to get a whole house one, it would have to go with propane because there's no gas in this neighborhood. Clem asks, when did this thing start? Uh, I started the stream at 2 o'clock, and that is central time. We're in Texas. So we've been going for 2 hours and 15 minutes. we got to wrap this up. But I see more questions, so I'm going to answer a few more. Um... What do you recommend to put in my refugium to clean up hair algae? I'm growing Gracielera macro. Uh, the hair algae, you pluck. What is it on? Is it on rock that you've got in there? Is it on the biomedia? Is it on the glass? Um, you know, where's it at? Is it on a power head? You know, but you should just manually remove the hair algae that bothers you. But technically, in, being in there doesn't really matter as long as it's not overgrowing the other algae you care about. But usually refugiums are small enough, you can just deal with it. You can just clean it up and make it look better again. Jay, you totally should. I mean, you've tried a couple times. Maybe third time's the charm. Has anyone tried using the LED replacement tubes for T5s? So it looks like a T5 bulb that has LEDs inside it. A couple of companies came out with them. There was one called the E-Bulb a few years ago. But I never heard if it was popular, if it, you know, if it took off. I think Current USA is the one that made those. Um, 
I do know that ReefBrite, and I use exclusively for ReefBrite, it seems like. My metal halides are ReefBrite, my XHOs are ReefBrite, my refugium light is ReefBrite, my other refugium light is ReefBrite, and then I have a Radeon and a Radeon and a Radeon. Um, all my ReefBrite stuff, they also make T5 bulbs. And he does something with T5 bulbs that I don't think any other company does. He makes them where they don't run as hot. And what I mean by hot is you can actually touch the fixture and not burn your hand. T5s are crazy hot. And the reason his don't run, or the reason it's good to have them not run as hot is the bulbs last longer versus a bulb that's cooking itself, they wear out sooner. So if you are thinking about getting T5s, I would definitely recommend talking to Tulio at ReefBright about getting his bulbs for your system. But the LED bulb that's inside the T5 tube, I've only seen it. I don't know anyone that actually did it themselves. Joseph says, is it easier to keep clams in an older tank than a new one? Absolutely. The more stable the tank, the more your success rate will be. Um, the younger the tank, the way more things are changing all the time. And it's just it's not ready yet. It needs to be stable. It needs to be solid. How long do you think I can keep a yellow eye coal tank in a that's about an inch long in a 22 gallon tank? I would say one year before people freak out. <laughs> uh, I think a year. It is going to start to grow bigger. 22 gallon tank is really small. I'm not a huge fan of tangs and small tanks, but I have one in a 60 over here and I had one in the 60 over there, but yours is 22. It's a third of what mine is. So um, I would plan on, it's good for now, but plan in 9 months to 12 months, you're upgrading to a bigger tank. And by bigger, we're wanting longer. The longer the tank, the more swimming room, which will be good for those tanks. Jimmy says, I have zoanthids in my tank. What do I do? My parents are scared and I have a baby sister. Please help. Uh, as long as you're not touching them, you're not licking them, you're not scraping them, you're not doing anything weird with them, they do nothing. My tank, these right here, are the most toxic pelitho on the planet. These are the ones used to murder people. <laughs> I hope the NSA is listening. This one right here is palithoa. It is super, super toxic. I've had this stuff in my tanks since 2002. And I've, or 2004. It came with a... 2002. It came with a 55-gallon aquarium I bought in 2002. And there's brown polyps. And under the blue lighting, they look green, which is really cool. But they're boring as can be. The nicer zoanthas, like those little orange ones that are kind of glowing right there. and You can't see anything. Um, I've got some up there that are really pretty. I've got lots of little colorful ones. The zoanthids have palytoxin, but every different one of them have different amounts of it. But it comes down to what are you doing that could affect things. So for example, a lot of times when you hear the horror stories about palytoxin, someone decided to boil their rock in a pot on a stove and they filled the house up with steam, filled with palytoxin, they inhale it and they all end up going to the ER and then the city freaks out and they put a tent over the house and they act like you've made nuclear power. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely dangerous. The f number one thing about palytoxin is get to fresh air. So and of course, get, seek medical attention if something bad were to happen. But have them in your tank is fine. They don't do anything. They're not going to do anything of their own accord. They'll never do anything on their own. It's usually when a human does something, which I'm going to say is quote unquote dumb, because they were doing something they shouldn't have been doing. So for example, if you were fragging zoanthids, and you had an open cut on your hand, and the juice got into your cut, you get sick. So you should have wore gloves. If you have the stuff squirted in your mouth, your mouth should be shut. If you have it squirted in your eyes, you should have eye protection or glasses or safety glasses. These are the things that protect you when you're actually handling them. And then whenever you handle them, don't touch your face while you're working with them because, you know, you rub your nose, you itch something, you'll get, your skin will go numb, your tongue could go numb, you could start tasting metal in your mouth, uh, you can feel like you're feverish, like you've got the flu. You know, these are the things that can happen. There's an actual great article about palytoxin poisoning over on the Masna website, masna.org slash palytoxin, I think is the link. And, uh, but for just to have pretty corals in your tank, they're not dangerous at all. It's when people do things like, oh, I'm going to scrub them off with a brush. 
I'm going to take them outside with a pressure washer and blast them off. I'm going to use a propane torch and burn them off. Zoanthids are actually beautiful corals that, why would you ever burn them off? What people are trying to get rid of are the pest palithoa that are ugly, like Texas trash pallies. They grow everywhere. And people are like, oh my god, I can't stand it. And they're, they're scraping it off, and the gel is in the water, and it gets on their hands, and they touch their face, or it squirts them in the eye. That's where the danger is. But not just having palithoa or zoanthids in your tank. They're not going to do anything bad to you. Uh, I do have a video on this channel about palitoxin that you can check out. <laughs> I think this is a super chat. It, it came queried across the screen, normally the colored. But uh, thank you very much for offering that cup of coffee. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Um... My rose bubble tip anemones were okay in my old tank for a year or so. Then I put them in a four-foot tank with the same lights and rock. Now they're not looking good. I've moved them. They're still not looking good. Um, it sounds like you just made a big change. So they are going to have to adapt, and they may not look good for a few weeks. They're not just going to close up like a rose and then reopen and be, you know, when I say a rose, like a flower, just and then reopen and be beautiful again just instantly. That's not how that works. When you move things or when you change tanks, when you take the rock out of the tank for a while and then put it in the new tank, it can cause a cycle. You might want to double check your water and see if there's any ammonia in the water or nitrite, which could be affecting them. It could also be those anemones have new neighbors they didn't have before. They're tasting something in the water from the flow blowing across some nearby coral that then gets to them next. Um, there's some of those things. It could be that the lighting has changed the intensity they typically will find the spot they want to live. I noticed you said you move them a couple of times. Normally they move themselves. You know, we just kind of provide a home. So I, I, I don't know how long has it been going that they're not doing well. Weeks? Months? You know, what's, what's happening? And by not doing well, what are they doing? And is it a certain time of day they look like that, but other times of day they look great? Because there are times in the daytime where they're all wide open in my tank, and then at night they're balled up like a ball of socks. So, you know, what exactly are we talking about? At 5 a.m., none of them look good. <laughs> Zoas Don't Kill. He did a video. He does a lot of videos like that, and the titles sound shocking. And there is a risk if you do some dumb stuff. But I've talked about all the dumb stuff that you could possibly do. And if you avoid all of those and don't lick them, you should be fine. Let's see. I see everyone's telling him not to touch them. Did you get your NDOC results yet? Nope, not yet. I love how people quote me. Don't lick the corals. Uh... ATF in the house says, I saw mention that anthelia and zinnia and clove polyps contain serious toxins. However, I couldn't find any information to corroborate that. Have you heard of this? No. Uh, again, this just has to be people doing things they shouldn't be doing. Um, those are all simple soft corals that do their thing. Uh, I do know when they die, they will release toxins in the water that can kill your livestock. So, like, if you had... I, I mentioned the story once before where a guy had a magnet in his protein skimmer split. Just, and the rusty stuff inside got into the water, and it killed all of his zinnia. When his zinnia died, all of his red planaria died. When his red planaria died, it killed his whole reef. And it was a cascading thing, all from a bad magnet. So, could that happen to anyone? Yes, a bad magnet can happen to anyone. It can be in a Vortec pump, it can be in a gyre, it can be in a cleaning magnet, it can be in a frag rack, it can be in a feeding clip. Um, 
It can be in a return pump. And when a magnet splits open, it causes chaos. That's why we are inspecting our gear. We're visually looking at things regularly. You know, when you've got your cleaning magnet, huh, I guess mine's around the corner. I always look at it and I, I try to make sure it still feels flat and doesn't feel like lumpy bumpy. If it's bumpy, I get a new one because it's obviously swelling within the case. When I take my vortex apart, I look at them, make sure the magnet's intact. Uh, when I take my return pump apart, I pull out the, the impeller and I look at that. So I check everything. And we just don't want anything to be in our tank that's breaking down, that's causing chaos, that can lead to killing things like clove or anthelia or zinnia uh, or what the other one you mentioned. Because if those things were to die, they're going to release stuff in the water. But we run carbon to take things out of the water. We run protein skimmers to take things out of the water. Some people have UV and ozone to take things out of the water. So you have all those things that will help keep things pure. But if a lot of something dies in your tank, it will become toxic. And that can affect the livestock way before it affects you. So something to keep in mind. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, we're wrapping up here. I know you guys can't stay here all day. Plus, I gotta start working on the video for tomorrow. <laughs> yes, Phil, you're right. I should totally get that done. Let's see. Dan says, can you get away with no water changes? Well, Dan, I've done two this year. How am I doing so far? Let's see. What's the place you want to go scuba diving the most? Uh, I really would like to go to Tahiti Bora Bora and, uh, of course, the Great Barrier Reef. Those are two I want to do. And uh, hopefully those will happen one day. I've done uh, Fiji. I've done Bonaire. Uh, I haven't done Cozumel, but I've done Florida. Um, I've done Dominican Republic. I've heard great stuff about Barbados. Um, so there's, there's plenty of places to go. Just need time and money, time and money. That's how it always is. <laughs> Let's see. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. It's, we've been at this for about two and a half hours. There's 166 people enduring my, my rambling. And uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in each week and learning. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to the channel, subscribe. If you haven't clicked the bell yet, you're supposed to do that to get the notification that the live stream is starting. Um, and then if your notifications are turned off in your app for YouTube, then you won't get the notification that you're waiting for. So make sure those are actually enabled. Um, I do appreciate, you know, the interaction we have every week. We're going to do another live stream next weekend. Um, there is a thing called Texas Coral Fest that's happening next uh, Saturday, I believe. I might have to put a message on the community tab. I might bump it to Sunday so that I can go to the Texas Coral Fest. Um, so we might do a stream on Sunday next week instead of Saturday. But I'm not positive. Maybe I'll just stay home. <laughs> so, you know, uh, or maybe I'll go to it after the stream. Or maybe I'll go to it before the stream. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure it out. But uh, we've got that to look forward to. We're always on Club Miller's Reef over on Facebook all day long, every single day. There's a lot of people on there enjoying our conversation. And I look forward to giving you another video tomorrow. Like I said, tomorrow is the sixth year anniversary of my reef tank. So I've got to do a lot of work today to get ready for tomorrow's video. And I thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, I will see you guys real soon. Bye.